In this episode, you're going to learn how to get into the best shape of your life and to enjoy the process. We also have a great debate between Adam and Sal. It gets a little bit heated. I don't disagree with you guys. Are you speak. sure about that? Yes. Bullshit. Listen, 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 Linda. And we have four live callers where the guys answer questions about testosterone, creatine, and the like. And by the way, if you don't like long episodes, go to Mind Pump Clips for short versions. All right, enjoy the episode. If you don't enjoy your workouts, something is wrong. Either your workouts or there's something wrong with you. The only way to have long-term success with exercise is to actually enjoy your workouts. So I know that came across a little harsh. Yeah, <laughs> but you may be doing it wrong. You know why I, you know why I said there's something wrong? Because uh, either A, your workout programming is super off, right? So if you're hating your workouts, if they're making you feel terrible, like look at that. But then there's another side to it, which is um, even pro like properly programmed workouts done correctly, they're going to be challenging, right? They have, that's part of the formula and you have to learn to enjoy that process. You have to learn to enjoy the workouts. So there's a, it's a dual thing. Like, is my workout wrong for me? And is my mindset wrong uh, for my workouts? That being said, I actually think this is a, a difficult thing for people to actually really gauge. Mm. In fact, in my experience, I've heard this many times from clients that, oh, I love this workout or it's my favorite way to train. And they say things like that because They've attached it to something like maybe they were in the best shape of their life when they trained that modality or nothing gets them to lose weight faster on the scale than that way of exercise. And so they say they love it. Right. There's some association there for sure. Yeah, like I, I, I'm not buying the like, I love this workout thing. Like you can, you want to prove to me you like doing Like for example, I get people that like, I love running. You've been running for five, 10 years straight every morning. Yeah. If I, you, love you love running. Yep. Yeah. You love running. Uh -huh. I believe you. But yeah. if you tell me like, oh, I love Orange Theory Fitness and it's like, that's your favorite thing to go on and off about all the time. Like, yeah. no, 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 I'm not buying that. I'm so glad you said that. One of the, the like, one of the hallmarks of somebody actually enjoying their workouts is that they do it consistently. Yeah, yeah. And that they've done it for years and years and years consistently. Yes. So, so that's the, that's the context. Do I enjoy this workout? Is this something that I want to do consistently forever? And if the answer is no, you're going to have to look at the workout and maybe look in the mirror. And the reason why I say look in the mirror is... Because there is a process of learning to love the the journey of exercise, right? Learning to love the process of exercise. That is part of this lifestyle, um, you know, this long-term lifestyle. <clears throat> but also, okay, to back to what Adam's saying, you got to look at your workout sometimes. Like if you love your workout because it beats you up, this is what a lot of people will say, right? Yes. Oh, I loved it. Why? Oh my God, I got so sore and yeah. I was so sweaty. Oh, I feel so amazing and afterwards. I feel so amazing afterwards. Yeah. Okay, let's see how long that continues with you. How long have you been doing it for? You know, the last month. Okay, well, let's see how long that sticks around. Have you guys had a client that came in and they were like, I just, I can't stand exercising. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. And then you're yeah. like, okay, but you're here. <laughs> now what do we do? Yeah. You know, like that's, man, that's a difficult place to be but it's it's such like baby steps of introduction i yeah. actually i actually found an answer for that person right because they would oh i hate exercising exercising to me is like i think right away like the, that generation of people that would come in and hire us like attaches that to like jane fonda circuit classes mm. sweating body pump like moving like pushing burning like all that and then i'm like well let's train instead instead of exercising let's train let's Let's find something you enjoy doing or find it. Like, do you want to get yeah. stronger at this thing? Or have you ever done this type of a movement and then teach them that and be like, hey, let's let's get good at this and let's focus on that. Let's not think of this as like exercise and you have to get this sweat or this burn or get like this crazy workout time. Let's let's pick something that you do enjoy doing and let's try and improve. Upon I actually that. prefer yeah. I would prefer it when a client said that to me when a new client. Oh, I hate exercise. OK, well, now. I'm glad we're starting with honesty. ground zero. Yes, because the person that comes in and, and hires me and says, "Well, I love, I love running." Well, do you run? Well, yeah. no, no, I, I don't run. I have before, but I don't do it now. Like, well, you actually don't love it. Um, I, you know, you might have an association with it, but you don't really love it. So, okay, you don't love exercise. Uh, you hate it. So here's how we're going to build a relationship with exercise over time. That's going to get you to enjoy it. And one of them is. Why are you doing this for? Is it because you hate yourself or because you care about yourself? That's mm -hmm. a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, maybe your association with exercise, you feel ter terrible during and afterwards. Well, you know what's going to be great about this? You're gonna, it's going to be hard, but you're going to enjoy it during, and you're going to feel better after than you did before because that's a, that's a key hallmark of a good workout is you have more energy 
after the workout than you did before. It invigorates you. No, that's and, a good point. I mean, I I totally see that in terms of somebody coming in with they've already had a previous experience sometimes that was like terrible. And so it like put this bad taste in their mouth in terms of like what they were going to expect going into this. And like, you were just going to punish them. And it's a lot of the, of it like stems from this kind of punishing mentality of, uh, you know, I have to do this is work and, uh, you know, it's painful and, and like, it doesn't, none of it has to be that way. Like we can actually like do a lot of things you actually enjoy and, and slowly kind of introduce you to things that you may not have done before. Yeah, I, I feel like it's, they attach it to either the best shape of their life or they attach it to the best results they have currently seen the way they've done things. And I'm reminded of like, when I first started dating Katrina, uh, she told me that she used to love running. And I'm like, you, what do you mean? You didn't, we, we've been dating for a while and I've never seen you run before. Well, I know I haven't had to, I need to get in shape now. And now I love to run. I'm like, okay. And then she'd go for these runs. But she had made that connection of that's how she managed her weight her whole life. Yeah. If I got if she got 10 or 15 pounds overweight in from where her normal weight is, she knew she could go hit the pavement, you know, run it, run it off. Mm-hmm. And she would get back down to that way. Therefore I love mm-hmm. running. Mm-hmm. That's how, that's the relationship with it. Once I taught her how to strength train and speed her metabolism up and sculpt and shape her body, ha, that girl hasn't ran since then. Yeah. You understand? Know what yeah. happened to love and running? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, no, she didn't love oh, running. This is better. They they love that that what happens is they they had some sort of success with that modality. And then they've now attached that to like, oh, this is my yeah. and they've probably tried other things, right? Mm-hmm. In the in the past. And that one thing showed them the most results. Therefore, I love that way of training. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, it. you don't though, yeah. because you you don't do it even when you're not mo- to me, if you love something, you do it even when you're not motivated. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Like That's if you it. if you like like my brother in law loves downhill mountain biking. That guy could go up and down and wade, not care about his fin- he is mountain biking no matter three, what. No matter what, because he has such a deep passion for that. That is somebody who I think loves that modality of co- of cardio and exercise, and we can build that into his training. But many times when clients would give me this bullshit thing, like I love yeah. this way of and doing you, and you can like, build no, you this don't. relationship. By the way, so if you're listening, you're like I hate it. Like you're not uh, you're, our bodies were designed to move. There's a relationship there that needs to get developed mm-hmm. to where you actually enjoy the process. And it takes a little bit of time. Part of it is understanding how it makes you feel, understanding the value, understanding it's a form of self-care, changing your relationship to pain, identifying uh, uh, appropriate pain with exercise, inappropriate pain with exercise. And by the way, and this is true, I of all the years I trained people, off the top of my head, and I think it was only three, there were three clients that I trained that became personal trainers. So they actually hired me and then they trained with me for a while and they eventually became trainers themselves. All three of them hated exercise when they hired me. It's a true mm-hmm. story. One was a kid and he was uh, shy and embarrassed and insecure, didn't want to go to the gym. He ended up becoming a personal trainer later on. Another one was one of my first clients when I opened my studio and she would work out on and off. Anyway, she became a trainer later on. Another one was somebody that literally the day that she hired me, she said, I'm only working out twice a week with you. And that's it. I'm not doing anything else. I hate exercise. All three of them changed the relationship to exercise to the point where they became trainers. It actually became the profession. Yeah. I mean, I, I went through a few of these kind of clients and, uh, you know, one of them was overweight and in a lot of pain. And it was like, there was a little bit of an experience before where the focus was just on losing the weight. And so I just completely focused on postural adjustments and mobility and, and taking her through like different ways to, to feel good and actually like, uh, you know, give her energy and, 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 and stamina and, and, you know, just really slowly introducing her into like lifting weights to where it was, it was one of those things. It was a totally different experience for her. And and then she bought in wholeheartedly once it was like, Oh man, I feel great. Now I feel like I'm motivated. Yeah. Yeah, A lot of it's tied to the results, right? If somebody is, I mean, it's like, how long do you go to that job and then don't receive a paycheck? I mean, and and then also tell people you love it. Like you don't ever see that. And it feels grueling and shitty. Yeah. No. So a lot of, I'm so glad you said that because a good job, a good career is not easy. Yeah. It's still challenging. Absolutely. But it's not grueling. What I mean by grueling is when you feel a sense of purpose behind what you're doing and something's challenging, it's not grueling. It's hard, but it's a good kind of hard. And you're right. You get the paycheck. You get the dividends. You yeah. feel it. Especially when it pays you well for what you do, yeah. what you love to do. So if you can find something you love to do and it pays you well, you really love it. And that tends to be similar to the relationship that people have with exercises. 
it's not easy. It's hard. And when it pays you shitty all the time, yeah. it's really tough to get yourself motivated. Why am to, I doing this? Yeah, why am I doing this? It's not paying me the dividends that I want for it. Same thing for an investment that's not paying you back. Oh, I hate this type of investment. Why? Well, because it doesn't ever give you the return I want. Well, okay. Once we figure out that piece, yeah. you completely start to change your relationship with it. You know, it. I, I did this yeah. with uh, nutrition, which I think is even harder. I think it's much harder to develop a good relationship with food than it is with exercise. Uh, that's, that's 100%. Um, and I'll stand by that. But I hated fish and I hated most vegetables for most of my life. Just didn't, I not, not didn't like them, hated them, did not like, like hated them completely. <laughs> and as I got older and I learned more about the health benefits and I had gone through some gut health issues and I was, I went on a trip to uh, Italy, to Southern Italy. And I said to myself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be open-minded. I'm going to eat more fish and I'm going to consciously pay attention to how it affects my body, how I feel over the course of that summer. I developed a relationship with seafood that now I enjoy eating. Now it's not my favorite food, so it didn't go from being something I didn't I hated to pizza, but I I now enjoy eating it because I saw the value and I connected that. Same thing with vegetables. I hated vegetables, but through eating them and identifying what they did for my body and my digestion, and now I actually will crave vegetables, especially when my gut health is off. That's one of the first things that I will crave will be I'm gonna get a bowl of vegetables, well cooked vegetables. Because it makes me feel good. So you. So my point with this is, you can, you can create this kind of relationship. And I can't think of a better way to be consistent with exercise for the rest of your life than finding a way to enjoy what you yeah. do. That'll do it better than. It's got to be sustainable. That'll do term. it better than anything else. What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway for today's episode: Maps Aesthetic. This is a bodybuilder-inspired workout program, and we're going to give it away for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. And then if we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you got free access to Maps Aesthetic. Also, we got a sale going on right now. We have two bundles, and we made both of them 50% off. Here's the first one. It's the Skinny Guy Bundle. Maps Anabolic, Maps Aesthetic, the No BS Six-Pack Formula, Intuitive Nutrition Guide, and the Occlusion Training Guide. All put together. 50% off. And then we also have a Fit Mom bundle, which is Maps Anywhere, Maps Anabolic, Maps Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So that's also 50% off. So if you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. I had an email I wanted to read you guys. I saw, uh, I think Katrina sent to me, so let me get it real quick. I totally forgot to share this with you guys. This is funny. It was regarding uh, Justin's... Um, Justin's conversation around uh, the his uh, funeral. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. See oh yeah, his grandma's funeral. Yeah, yeah. Is this yeah. somebody that works at like a funeral? Uh, what do you call those places? Home. Um, yeah, memorial. Yeah, home. yeah. So it's the funeral director. What about that? Where is that? At? I thought it was texting me. Did you guys get it too or no? Did you yeah, see it, Doug? Bro, your your ADD <laughs> outranks mine. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. Like it's I'm, all in another. I know. I'm sorry. I apologize for the like two seconds. Yeah, uh, I thought it was. I thought it was sent to all of us. Maybe it was emailed to me. Hold on. Yeah, it's right. Sorry. <laughs> all of us are there. looking for. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, I can't find it, but I do. Rem I, I I don't know. Do you remember generally what it's No, no, I want to find it, dude. Stop it. I'm going to you can, go, you, can, you can move along the conversation and I'll, and I'll bring it to you cuz okay. I I want to read it cuz it made me laugh. I am surprised well, whoever... it. Uh, you want me to read it? Oh, you uh, have it? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So it was What in, group is it sent it's to? In the executive assistant. Oh. It did get sent to all you assholes. Come on. Jesus, dude. <laughs> hey, literally oh, everybody nice. has it. How did bro, you get mad I just at me literally for losing my some... phone and found it? Okay. <laughs> he gets mad at me so, for something yeah, exactly. you're going to bring up on the show. <laughs> you guys fault. Yeah. Um it says, good afternoon. I'm a funeral director, and I can assure the guys that casket lids are fastened in one manner or another. The type that uses a crank to close are more secure than lids with latches, so the latch ones could potentially open with a sufficient drop. Either way, a few hundred pound of casketed person sliding on top of a pallbearer as they fall into a grave is something that gives directors nightmares. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what the, what? That's the whole thing. It's like I, I had this vision of like, so I was slipping and falling. And it was like, 
if I go down, I'm not, it's not just going to be me that goes down. Like I was pushing my brother out of the way. I was going down. I'm like, and grandma. grandma's going to be on top of me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, it opens. Like, oh, ah! oh, we're going together. Ah! Like, yeah. oh, fuck it. <laughs> Everybody just, <laughs> just like, push well, the dirt in. It's been a good He's already run. there. Cover uh, them up. Give the yeah. family like half off. Oh, I, was like, I was like, is this too dark to bring it? I thought it was hilarious. No, I mean, yeah. it's up to you. It's so, your grandma. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say it. Yeah. But, uh, dude, I tell you guys, uh, uh, man, this morning I almost, uh, boy, the gym sometimes, right? It can be the happiest place on earth. And sometimes it's a uh, boy, it's the one place I might, might get myself thrown in jail. I was working out this morning in a hurry. So I'm in a hurry, right? I got to bring the car. <laughs> so I'm already wondering whose fault this is. Yeah. You were the members. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm working. I'm in a hurry. I got to put my car, I got bring my car to service. We got to come in here, get on some live questions, do the whole thing. So I don't have much time, right? I got like 25 minutes and I've been experimenting with shorter workouts anyway, but I got, that's it. I got 25 minutes and I got to get out. Yeah. So I get in there and I'm doing some stuff and I see a machine that I want to use because it's uh, convenient. It's going to do what I want and I got, I'm going to do it. Anyway, there's a guy using it. He's doing a set. Then he sits on it on the bench and he's texting on his phone. Was it the adductor machine? No. Yeah, it was that. I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm really trying to build my inner thighs. No, it, so it was, a, it was a chest press machine. So- <laughs> I see him and he's sitting down and he's texting. So I'm like, okay, I'll do this thing over here and I'll wait for him to finish. So I'm watching him as I'm, as I'm working out. I'm keeping an eye because I want to make sure I jump on it. I sw- okay, it's not wait, Give me the full visual here too. Are you, uh, are you down to the wife beater yet? No, that happens at the end. Oh, okay. That's full pump. Oh, okay. this, is, yeah, this is like beginning of the He wasn't vain enough this yet. Is, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is not. Uh, that happens this explains the, a lot. It's probably why he didn't get off the machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, wasn't, he didn't see what was happening. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Didn't, yeah, yeah okay. you just show him the full yeah. color. Yeah, bro. you sure? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm watching. Hey, listen. Literally 10 minutes, he's sitting on the bench texting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sitting, texting. Text. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ask him if I can jump in between sets. So I wait for him to do another set. He does. He stops. Let me paint the picture a little further, okay? I hope I don't offend anybody, but if I do, whatever. So this guy's wearing two masks. So he's in the gym, right? He's got one, two. So I can see that there's two. Hoodie, mm-hmm. goggles. No, he doesn't. Goggles. Hoodie, yeah. goggles, latex gloves. Latex gloves. Okay? I knew it, dude. And he's And he's young guy. He's like in wow. his 20s, okay? Really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All covered up, right? And he's doing- He's got a condom on too. Probably. Yeah, underneath his pants. Yeah. He's wearing a seatbelt. Yeah. So I go, okay. <laughs> I go, all right. So I go up to him, hey man. Yeah. Uh and he's life like, preserver. Yeah, and he's got like he's got like headphones, he's like doing this. I'm like, hey, listen, uh, let me jump in real quick. What what you know, while you're resting. And he goes, Oh, bro, I only got two more sets. So I'll I'll be done. I'll be done soon. So now I'm like, he triggered me right away. Cause that's gym etiquette. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a selectorized piece of equipment. All you gotta do is move the pin. So I'm gonna move it from your 10 pounds to my 200 pounds, whatever. I'm gonna move the pin, <laughs> put it back afterwards. <laughs> 10 it's, pounds of full stack. <laughs> yeah, I'm not taking plates off and do it. It's just a, it's that's it, right? Yeah. So now he annoys. So as soon as he says that, he goes, No, oh, man, I got two sets. I'm almost done. I said, Listen, I said, while you're sitting on the bench for 10 minutes texting your girlfriend, I could do a set. And he goes, Oh, my bad, bro. And he walks off and he takes <laughs> off. Is <laughs> the way I looked at it. Did my set, we were done. People need. <laughs> Need to learn gym etiquette. Such a bully, dude. I don't yeah. understand. I've never said no to anybody on a machine. Now, if you yeah. come to my deadlift and no, you want to take all the plates It's a forgotten off, thing. I don't understand that. It's yeah. like you're not you're renting the equipment. You don't own the gym. He yeah. doesn't sound like a very advanced lifter to me. No. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like so he's been lifting very yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm sure he was afraid. It doesn't sound like he's been outside much. Was that, is empathy. that a real get up? I've never seen somebody. Yeah, that, I haven't dude. been in gyms lately. Bro, so. it was yeah. everything. But I, 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 and he's that's not common. That's that's nobody's like that. But and I, I have empathy. I'm sure he's you know he's probably afraid. Right? Doesn't want to, whatever. And you know I, I'll, I'll, I you know I wiped everything down afterwards, but. Come on, bro. You're in a gym. That's gym etiquette. And you're and you're sitting on the bench for 10 minutes. Yeah. What the hell are you doing? Let know. me use He's that piece of equipment. Afraid you're that gym, two times that's happened to me with him. And then there's another guy in there that reserves like six pieces of equipment. Like literally, there's six pieces of equipment. Yeah. And so what I've done now in the morning, and this is just as a this is as a courtesy to the gym manager. So I'm doing this for you. Gym manager, if you're watching, yeah. I purposely go and use the equipment when he's when he's hurting when he's when he's hoarding. You're like, I didn't even want to do those, but I'm gonna do. I didn't want to do it <laughs> just to I, make a point of doing it. I literally walk over to one and I sit on same. it and do like three, four sets. Yeah, and then wait for him to try to say something or get the 
guts to say something? Yeah. Because I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Six know. pieces of equipment? Come on. I do the same thing. Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. Uh, of course you do. Yeah. yeah. Of course you guys yeah, do. Bunch of gym it. bullies, dude. No, it's Bunch like of gym bullies it's over corrections. here. Corrections. Huh? Okay. Like, yeah, we got to bring it back to yeah. that etiquette part, dude. You, you know what? What's the hilarious thing I wanted to bring up to you guys? Like, uh, there's this company that reached out, and I'm not gonna throw their name out there, or whatever. But um, their whole thing is that. They want to pitch to influencers, I'm sure within like 50 to whatever, 100,000 followers, like a way to monetize and like, like basically absolve them from like a lot of the work that goes into it by basically like copying, like how you post things, like doing all this stuff and creating like an, an art artificial intelligence version of you to then sort of carry on uh, your posts and, and be like this like, artificial celebrity version. So is it software that breaks down the out, like sees like, my, let's say my pattern is like, you know, post of his son, funny meme post, yeah, workout yeah. post. Like it, is Make it, fun of Sal. Yeah. Like, yeah. Moody. Like, is it, yeah, is yeah. It, is it, there's no moody post. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fucking guy. Business, business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's moody. Yeah. No moody yeah. We call me moody. <laughs> there. There's definitely some patterns yeah. there yeah. that they could no, figure out. I was just out. kidding. Yeah. So, uh, I don't want to get any you know, shoes. Uh, I, I prefer asshole over moody. Yeah, I know. I say it on purpose. <laughs> you <laughs> like being an asshole. I'd rather be an asshole. I'm not going to call you an asshole. Moody. You smile. I was like, dude, how accurate Moody that? sounds like a wuss. I almost <laughs> want to try it. Like, don't you guys want to try it? Like, but it also makes me speculate, right? So you know the whole thing with Twitter and Elon, and like, he's yeah. like, dude, there's like way more bots on here than dude, was reported. Did you guys hear that Twitter? The guy, the executive who he's he was the hired. whistleblower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was first off, I didn't know that the the whistleblower law that they passed. I think it was it part of Dodd Frank. Encourages do it, and they get paid. I did not know that. Yeah. Either. So it's part of Dodd Frank, the, the the legislation where if you're a wow. whistleblower, you're entitled up to thirty percent of the settlement. So let's say you whistleblow, you work for, you know, a chicken comp chicken food company or whatever and you're like they're 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 pumping antibiotics into the organic chicken or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if they sue them, you get 30% of the settlement. Plus you don't need that. to plus you can keep yourself um anonymous. Yes, anonymous. Dude. But anyway, I saw, I saw the although that's almost impossible. That's crazy. I, I don't know if I think like out of out of all the whistleblower yeah, cases, like, like, like two people have been anonymous. I think I they've heard already them. awarded almost a billion dollars. Yeah, no, the last I saw the list of like the last like ten whistleblowers made like over a hundred million. Yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, you're complete. You're blackballed forever. Yeah. It's true. Like if, if you, you're a high executive uh, enough yeah, that you yeah. can blow a whistle on a billion dollar company, you're not going to get a job. <laughs> yeah. The industry you, over. Yeah. You might get. You might win, but then you're you're cashing yeah. out. You know. Monica what I'm Lewinsky never got a job in the White House again after all that. <laughs> I don't know. So <laughs> she, wrote a, she wrote a book though that was it a New York Times bestseller, didn't she? She did. Yeah. yeah. What I is she doing? Actually, that's part. Where's she at right now? Let me see Monica where she's Lewinsky? at. What's she doing now? <laughs> she's she has a cigar business. I heard. No. Oh, no. Are you serious? No. no. <laughs> I mean, there's. I mean, what's his name? Are you tired uh, of dry cigars? Remember, remember, uh, what's his name? Bob <laughs> went into moist. porn after his thing got cut off. I, know. which you would have never thought yeah, that was he possible. Had, he didn't make no money. Are you sure? I mean, who's going to watch? I mean, I guess maybe you're right. I don't know. I guess a lot of people. I think he it. made a bunch of money, actually. What was I, it, the first name? Andre? Or what was his first no, name? No. Uh, uh, well, I know his wife was Lorena Bobbitt. Yeah. What was his What was his first name? Know. What was his name? Doug, you know him? Uh, 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 <laughs> I do not John, know him. No, not huh? John. Oh, John. No, it was him. John. I think yeah. it was John. John Bobbitt? I think it was. You have a couple uh, things to look up over there, dog. Doug. 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 He made a porn career after that, right? That's yes. What just yeah, said. That's what just said. Said. Are you here? Listening. Are you here? Fucking <laughs> guy. I wasn't listening. Fucking guy. Hey, so uh, that was only Sal we ignored. <laughs> so hold on a second. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's John Bobbitt. John Bobbitt. John Bobbitt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so oh, listen. Right. So this whistleblower for Twitter, he yeah. comes out and he says, number one, they don't want to count all the bots. Mm -hmm. Number two, the executives are in, are actually incentivized not to because they get paid on users and nobody and they're not nobody's telling them to figure out which ones are real or not so you don't want to tell everybody that you have bots because you're getting paid yeah to have just more users yeah that was a great conversation on all in podcast between Ch uh, chamath and uh david Sachs because yeah. chamath thought that the the whistleblower didn't really strengthen elon's case and david Sachs says i disagree i th i agree with Sachs. yeah i agree with Sachs too i, I mean this it, was i mean okay keep, this was a, this was a top uh, tech security um, engineer. So they hired, because remember Twitter had this like breach yeah. where all these celebrities got hacked. Mm -hmm. So they hired this guy. This is the guy that came out. Yeah. And uh, also he says that Twitter allowed India 
to pay them to allow one of their secret service or not secret service, one of their spy, one of their spies unfettered access mm. to users' accounts and, and DMs and stuff. Now that's wild to me. Yeah. That I a just, company would do that. Yeah, dude. I mean, and, and it, again, like anytime you question anything, you're a conspiracy theorist, right? But uh, in terms of like all these bots and just how influential Twitter has been over the last few years in, in terms of like how we look at culture, like it, it literally is driving culture and, and driving all these narratives and driving yeah. like all these different like causes and things and animosity and, and, and people that are upset. How many people are really upset? I just can't, <clears throat> I can't think that like with that many bots and that many, influences that aren't even real people that have like shaped the way that our culture is right now. Like, how are we not looking at that the, as the major problem? The part that, that really I think is interesting to me, and we've kind of like lightly discussed it before that, cause I know we can, we rag on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and these platforms and stuff, but the guys who created this, I, I think most all of them are libertarian. Yeah. They were all very like yeah, Jack free Dorsey information. Trying to do free, something different. Yeah. He's definitely that way. Zuckerberg was too. I mean, yeah, they're, yeah. they're disruptors. Well, I the mean, internet it's, it's really unfortunate that it, it, it you know, and I, and I think maybe when you first, you know, build this vision, right. And this idea of what you think it's going to look like, and then it kind of gets out of control or gets so huge that you kind of lose control of the, of the direction it goes like, well, the, in, the internet was and, and largely is still, but definitely was in the early days. Um, it was anarcho capitalist. It, yeah. There were no, I mean, it was, there was nothing and it organized and progressed itself, uh, to what it's become, uh, because of the, of markets within that. Uh -huh. Now my, here's my theory, my th and this after September 11th, this, uh, this laws were passed essentially that allow this to happen where if, if it's, in this, in the, if it's for national security, they can literally approach a company and say, you need to do this. By the way, there's no judge trial or jury for this. There's no warrant. Okay. They have their own committee or whatever, their own panel. Well, wasn't this what Zuckerberg admitted to? Well, or? they, I, I, I don't, I didn't listen to that interview, but okay. did he? Okay. Yeah, yeah. He admitted he to it. And then the FBI came out and actually released a statement in regards to his case. Okay, so if you look at some of the stuff yeah. that was passed after September 11th, Patriot Act, uh, NDAA and some other things. They can literally go to a company and say, this is in national security interests. You, we recommend you do this. If you don't, we could take you to a secret court and, or throw you in jail and not tell anybody. And by the way, we never, we don't have to admit it. And this is all law. So we were protected with by you need a warrant they need to have to go to a judge you have because be, they can label you as a terrorist and then that's the end that's a wrap and so so now it makes sense that all these tech companies that compete aggressively in the market simultaneously kick people off at the same time which makes no sense to me like you look at what happened to donald trump like him or hate him the guy had hundreds of well, millions look, look, not billions take, of something, followers. take something more current look what's happened to andrew tate right now andrew tate gone instant yeah. everybody took him off, off every the same platform time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Jones was the first. Right. Well, okay. So take anybody, okay? If you have Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, you know, you have all these different platforms, right? All these competing social media platforms. And one of them kicks off this person who's got a billion followers or a hundred million followers. You as a competing platform are happy. You're like, welcome with open arms, right? Oh, come on over here. Bring all your followers. But all of them simultaneously yeah. kick people off. And remember, I, I brought up Donald Trump for a reason because he got kicked off everything at the same time. Yeah. And then he got kicked. And his, the, the servers that held a, an app that, that kept him on got kicked off. So that's all weird. I shit. mean, that's like very conspiratorial. I think that. Bro, it's, tell me a time when yeah, but I think, I think, I think like Yeah, but I think you could be as easily. I think it'd be as simple as there, there's a very, uh, you know, woke group of people that are. Uh, running they're making the big decisions of those companies it's not that far-fetched to think that you know the the generation that's growing up right now that's been indoctrinated by our school systems is a, a much more left-leaning progressive person and they are now the executives and the decision makers in a lot of these social media co companies they still compete so, in the market they still want to make money i yeah but, and yeah, i don't but, think all of them at the same time would do it i think there would be one or two yeah it hurts their business bullshit and, and look at netflix they had to change their team because they listen, losing. listen 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 linda it's does not if <laughs> if donald trump gets kicked off of of, uh, off of Twitter, uh, Facebook ain't making that much more money if they accept him with open arms. I'm sorry. It is it is peanuts compared to what that like that is nothing. 
So yes, you're right. Competitively, are you speak- sure about that? Yes. Well, look what happened to CNN after Donald Trump got kicked out and is off the internet. You're talking about traffic. That CNN is not a is not a money cash machine like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter are. I mean, those those. Companies- I think it's still money on the table. And my point is, with when it comes to competition. Look, even the most progressive person will say this. I don't Businesses disagree with you. Make money. I don't disagree with you that it's not. It's and you're not, right. I have no evidence. This is. Just I, I don't. I don't disagree yeah. that it's not it's advantageous to bring that person on, and that it wouldn't help potentially help, and it doesn't potentially hurt. But I'm saying that it, it's insignificant to the size of that company. That I think it's more likely that the decision makers in, in all those social media are align politically. Yeah. You're sure, and, but and how the, did it happen the, all at the, the same time? Fact all were in one camp. It I happened mean, all at the same time. I mean, yeah. I mean, and you don't think they all communicate and are in similar they're, circles? Okay, so you think I mean, that they're, they're all silk? They're all Silicon Valley. They're all here. They're all fucking eating, probably having coffee and shit, same place. You think so? Sure. I don't think so. That's yeah. like saying all the like. I all, think that's more likely than the FBI, CIA coming in and saying we're going to get rid of Andrew Tate. Because we think he's a threat to our society. I, I think. I think. I think that's say, less likely. I don't know, man. I don't know. I would look up things like Operation Mockingbird, which is I, this, yeah, okay. Now you're, now you're see that's not fair. Now you're now you're mm-hmm. you're bridging over to things that we know the Do you know government's what done that is crazy. That Justin is, knows. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, they infiltrated Hollywood. Yeah, that was part of the plan. Yeah. I I just think that the this the simple answer is normally the right answer. Okay, and to to think that it's this crazy orchestrated conspiratorial thing. I think it's. Is more simple. Likely. What I'm saying, I think, is more simple than what you're saying. I think what yeah. you're saying is more complex. I think what you're saying requires more coordination from competing companies who normally are fighting what? for users. What? I hundred percent. You think it's that much coordination to be the main person at at Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to pick up the phone or meet them for coffee because we're all in the same damn city and go, "Hey, we're ripping Andrew Tate off next week. We're shutting mm-hmm. him down." Yes. You, you know, know what? Well, so we, we knew yes, that we knew that the FBI that, met with on. Facebook. Uh, you know, back when they were looking for certain terrorists and they yeah. wanted their back in, they wanted their back door. Yeah. And, you know, or, or Apple too. And then they publicly were like, oh no, we're not going to do it. And then all of a sudden after closed doors in a while. Well, where like, do you guys stand on that? Do you not want our, our FBI, CIA to be able to have access? Okay, let's say we have a real terrorist threat I, th- I and they're on that I'm, social platform. Do you want them to not have access? That That's that's not the right question. Of course I do. Oh, I want them question. to have to get a warrant. I want that to be. I want them to have to go through the court system. That's yeah. the only protection. Yeah, we but have. That, the problem with that is like, okay, it's there's a bomb coming record. on Tuesday. We just found out about it today. Bullshit. What do you mean bullshit? No, nah, that's bullshit. We're we're way more in danger from from eroding that protection than we are from. We couldn't fix. Look, trust me. You want to get a warrant? The FBI, CIA wants to get a warrant. They'll get it. And they'll go in and make it happen. If this whole thing about we need to be faster about it and we can't tell anybody or whatever, baloney. I don't buy that at all. And and it's been misused so many times. Yeah. We know this. Well, we that's the problem. To me, that's the problem. The misuse of it is is the problem of it. Uh, that's where I, I mean I agree with you there. Like it's not that I I say oh it, they should be able to do it and then we should be able to abuse it, but it's like it does put you in this interesting predicament that you pass it you pass a law like because Obama passed that right was it Obama who passed that and, and after nine eleven who was no it? no that was Bush it was Bush, it was Bush well, who passed Obama that, railed yeah. against it and then became the president and then signed it. Oh, okay. And that's that's the game. So Bush pushed. Yeah. Okay, so Bush yeah. put it out. Obama signed it eventually. Uh, well, and continued. Every president has continued to extend it. Okay. Yep. So yep. I mean, so, I mean, so obviously there was a, a reason why we did it around that time, and there's a reason why we've kept it going. And we, what we see on from our seats is the conspiratorial yeah. crazy. No, what I well, see, there's real threats, no, no doubt. Yes. You know, and and that's something that we do have to consider, but. It also, too, like the the whole speed thing is what I always get like really nervous about, and just like like if you can take somebody bypass like um, jury and bypass a lot of the uh, the checks and balances that we have in place for a reason. Like to me, like I, I I'm worried about the everyday average citizen of that. I point. just okay, okay. I mean, I don't disagree with you guys, but for you guys to think that okay, what was the there was a there was a great documentary that we all saw that was. Um, the guy that was basically grooming women, um, like uh, um, was it the, the, the Taliban guy that was grooming women and stuff like that on Facebook, he would he would befriend them, get them to fall in love. Like, you, did you watch that one, Doug? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You I watched. You got, we all yeah, watched it. I know we all watched it. I can't. Mm. But anyway, so this guy was, and I believe it was the Taliban. He was a part of or one of, one of those radical groups, right? And he would groom women and get them to fall in love with them. And you, okay, so let's take an example like that. That really happens. That was a, a, yeah. a okay. And 
we get word that he's doing that, which this happens in the documentary where mm -hmm. he they're considering bombing a city or doing something like that, and it's supposed to fucking happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we want access right now to everything we can. And he's all over. He's using yeah. social media as the platform for him to do this fucking dirty, to orchestrate these people, to get these, to recruit these women. And we find out about it today and something, is our inside person tells us, and tomorrow something's going down. Yeah. You guys, oh, we got to wait till Tuesday to go to court. And then, no, I mean, no, you no. make phone calls. You get, you get the warrant. And that's not true. Listen, here's a deal. That, that's the story that they tell you. But if you look historically at how these powers get, um, abused. Whoever's in power uses them politically. This has been proven many times. Civil rights leaders have been harassed and followed. The FBI, uh, boy, they have a bad track record for people like Martin Luther King, um, celebrities like um, you know the Beatles, and that you, you can see historically how some of the stuff they did. And this was back when you had to go mm -hmm. and get a war. Now they can do. I mean, here's the thing. I what. And look, I'm playing devil's advocate with you because I think we all align on on the free market, the small government. I'm not a fan of big government. I'm not a fan on all this stuff like that. But I I do I can see both sides of this argument, and it, therefore I'm challenged with what is the right policy, what is the right way to handle a situation like that. Because 100, percent I would want the CIA or FBI had to have immediate access to somebody like that who threatens the lives of somebody in our country for sure. At the same time, too, I recognize that it's a slippery slope where we're heading and now we allow these people to get in there and do a lot of fucking shit that we don't we, we can't control now so you, 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 those protect the protections exist to protect the citizens from uh its own government okay that's what those so if you look at things like covid oh my god if we just controlled people enough we would have saved more lives that's the argument right oh if we just did what china did and we lock more people down oh you know oh you guys you, you know, Second Amendment, we just had no guns. There'd be no more violence, right? Uh, uh, what, would you like the government going through your physical mail? Well, you just- you Walking just, in your you house just, and you searching just, your You just shit? name things that we, we we can make as decisions and control of our own lives versus terrorism. The terrorism put, put a whole new ball game. No. Do you want, would you allow government to just go in your house whenever they want, look through your shit without a warrant? No, of course I don't want What's that. What's the difference? It's not. That's what I'm saying, though. Okay, but at the same time, too, I would want it for the guy who's about to go blow fucking your your kid's yeah. school up, bro. Yeah. Okay, it, uh, we got word tomorrow. He's he's taking a bomb to your kid's school, and we need access to. Him I don't think that. I don't think. I mean, so I, I am. I'm torn, through, bro. I don't want yeah. them coming through my house because they have a hunch or some bullshit. Yeah. Because I do want my privacy protected, but at the same time, too. I want them to have access to that if it means saving my child's life because we got some sort of inside information that yeah. this person is well, using social media to coordinate a fucking attack on a school. Well, I know that that's the, that's the argument that they make, but it's not, uh, it, it doesn't get in the way. It, if anything, it, what gets, what, it gets in the way of them abusing their power, mm. if anything. And I know you can pay, so we can create scenarios and say, yeah. well, you know, so to me, but it's not black and white is my argument. Mm. Okay. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. not as simple as, oh, stay out of it. Yeah. it. You know, we shouldn't allow them being. It's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's just some sort of an exception to the rule for certain things, or maybe there's something they have to be able to prove or show in order to do it. What do you have to say, Doug? I think it's time to move on. That's yeah, what I thanks. have to say. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Doug. You guys have exhausted this time. I know. I thought you had something to contribute. I do. That's my brilliant thing I have to contribute. Gosh, it's a damn terrible it. contribution. So, I think so. it's a great contribution. I think uh, people will actually agree with me. Oh, great. Doug gets all the likes now. <laughs> Appreciate that, Doug. Anyway, let's talk about the supplement acetyl L carnitine. Let's change gears here. <laughs> That's uh, a terrible transition for hey, that. Hey. <laughs> hey, you're the one Does always telling Doug to cut stress? us off when it's yeah. I know. No, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, yeah. although I think that uh oh, he didn't stop Doug. No, no. <laughs> we can move, we can move here. Finish. We can move on from here. But I think it's a it's a it is a a conversation that um I one I think the 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 two sides that argue about it a lot of time they don't argue it right, and I think it, it isn't. I don't think it is as simple as is black or white. Yeah. And uh, you know, as much as Doug wants to move on from this conversation, I think these are the conversations that people are really having. Like, in I mean, I appreciate it when I hear other people that I respect, intelligent, that have an intelligent argument to defend yeah. each side. You know what I'm saying? I want to hear. I want to hear. Maybe your we side. weren't that intelligent. Maybe that's the <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> hey, listen, listen. We'll get back to CLL L carnitine because I got a cool study about that. But I'll I'll transition to something a little lighter. Uh, did you guys know that? So monkeys apparently are evolving now, Justin. Uh, oh, and, really? Uh, yeah, some monkeys have been, been observed as to going into the Stone Age, so they're using like tools and stuff. And uh, <laughs> they found some monkeys now that are using um, tools as sex toys. You guys know this? <laughs> I swear to God. Some monkeys are using stone tools as sex toys right now 
uh, which is pretty cool. Female monkeys are more selective with their stones. Is this right? in the wild? <laughs> <laughs> wow. is, is this in the wild? This is in the wild. <laughs> this is in the, research concluded. Researchers concluded that some monkeys in Indonesia use stone tools to masturbate. Wow. Yeah, so they're coming for us, man. No pun intended. <laughs> is, this, is this patient zero for monkey pox? That's what you asked to be transitioned <laughs> to, old guy. That's what you asked to get out of. Uh, there you go. That's the best thing. There you go. <laughs> monkeys are crafty, dude. Yeah. It's wild, though. You know, it's funny because we we, we do see that monkeys, like, they start to evolve their use of tools and stuff. They learn from each other. Yeah. And this is just something new that we just, uh, we've just observed. It's just kind of cool. So in like a million years, they'll be <laughs> using... Vibrators and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right, back to the CLL quarantine. Uh, actually, read a study on, so we work with a company called Live On. <coughs> Live On, um, you, they make nutrient supplements and they put it in a liposomal packet. So it's really absorbable. Anyway, one of their products is acetyl L-carnitine. I've been reading a lot about it. And I told you guys before how uh, L-carnitine can increase androgen receptor density. So these are the receptors that testosterone attaches to. Um, I also read some studies showing that for some people with mild depression, um, acetyl L-carnitine can help improve some of those symptoms, especially older adults. So this is like a, a supplement of interest uh, for a lot of uh, medical researchers at the moment. How do they track and measure something like that? Like, what are the controls on, on a situation like that? Because, so, you know, we talk about, like, somebody who, like, takes supplements tend to also be people that care about their health. And oh, no, this is, this is these are controls. So, take okay. people with mild, mild moderate depression, have them supplement with acetyl L-carnitine, then self-report. Nothing report. else changes. Yes, and then yeah. self-report if they feel better or worse. And it does have a measurable effect on uh, depression, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Now, for fitness, for training, it does seem to reduce muscle damage a little bit, supplementing with this. So if you're like on the border of overtraining or you constantly push yourself, it may be a supplement uh, that you can use to get yourself to be able to work harder and longer yeah, yeah. in your workouts. You know, speaking of our partners, you know, I brought up, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago or so, uh, Magic Spoon, seen them at Target. And the um, price, and we were doing, I think we we're trying to do the math. I think Andrew corrected me later on, like that we were, that was like within what, a dollar or 25 cents or something like that of what the price was. And I saw uh, Target put it on sale. So it's even cheaper. So it was a dollar cheaper. So it's even cheaper than what our discount was at the time. And I'm like, that's so crazy that they offer the, uh, a, the at a retail store like that, a, a lower price than what the direct to consumer is. I always get frustrated when our brands, do something like that because I know they track the URL for mm. our people. Well, our code gives you five dollars off. Yeah, so does off that bring it, it down? To what? Yeah, it, it makes it close. Okay, but it actually, I mean, you're, I mean, we're arguing over cents right now. Okay, but I mean, one of the things that that I always negotiate for us, I don't, you, I don't know how much you guys know this or not, but one of the things when I'm negotiating like with a partnership about us doing advertising with them, I I'll take less money for us to be guaranteed the best deal. Of course. Because that just for our audience. Yeah, it's like I, I don't want our audience like, oh, I found it on Amazon for this. Oh, I found it over here that for this. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I'll tell the company like, hey, is this the best you you offer anywhere? And they'll be like, yes, that's the lowest. Or if they say no, sometimes we run these sales. I say, well, I want the lowest price possible. You can pay us less money so we can guarantee that. Oh, so that's great. when I see that, I always get irritated or frustrated. But I don't know how much they have control of that. Or you negotiate when you're with a, I don't know if anyone knows how that works. I don't know if you know, Doug, when it comes to like when a company farms out to like Target or Walmart or maybe Costco. they buy so much of it, that yeah, they that they have it. more control of the price and they and then like Magic Spoon doesn't have a say in it. Do you know if that's how it works? Yeah, I have no idea what the, the negotiations look like, but you think a, a company like Target, you know, they have locations all over the place and they're yeah. buying thousands of boxes of it. So, well, nonetheless, they're blown up. Yeah. That company is that cereal is everywhere. It Everywhere. has exploded yep. since we started working with them. I I, I feel hear. like you could even sell it if you're a gym owner, like up the front. Remember in Gold's Gym, oh, yeah. they had like, uh, you know, some protein shakes that are just like a one serving one and like uh, some of the rip fuel and all that kind of stuff. Like I imagine a like a single serving, yeah, cereal box. That, that you could that pour milk right inside? Just right inside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I would. Oh you know, there's God. brand. I, so I, this was, I don't know if it was brought to my attention from a, a, a listener or who, how, where this came, I came across this, but I saw Wheaties has a, a brand called Wheaties Fuel. And I thought it was new, but it was actually something that they've had in the past and then it's gone away. So they've attempted like this higher protein type of. It's a market. It probably tastes like crap. And it didn't do, well, it didn't do very well. So and I don't know. I, I didn't, I don't know why. I don't know the history on it. Maybe Doug can pull it up and see if it still exists. But um, I know that they tried to do that and it didn't happen. The challenges that hmm. I would, I would imagine with that market would be 
your typical cereal owner probably really didn't care about protein. And so then when they see a box of cereal, because protein's expensive. So they're like, wait, Wheaties fuel. It's like 50% more expensive. I, I, I 100% yeah. agree with you, Sal, because that, I mean, that's the biggest hurdle and challenge we have even selling it on the podcast is I always see people, oh my yeah. God, that's For so expensive. Cereal? And then I have to remind them. Yeah. Okay. It's whey protein. It's whey protein in there. So if you took your bottle of whey protein and you just put it in your cheap bottle or your cheap bowl of Cheerios, and then you did the math of your scoop of whey protein yeah. added to the price of the bowl of the cereal, it would come out to be about the same or even more than what that is. It's yeah. that simple. It's like, yes, you cannot. And so for the people that try and compare it to regular cereal, like, yeah, no, it's not. You're not trying to replace. You're actually trying to meal replace. The idea is it's supposed to replace a balanced meal and Cheerios, okay, or shredded wheat or Lucky Charms is not a balanced hey, meal. Man, it's just, a, it's just carbs and sugar, you know? Yeah, I love it. Do you guys remember when they put the red balloons in Lucky Charms? That was a big deal. No. <laughs> you don't remember that? More like, like it was new? Better. Yeah, they didn't have the red balloons for a while. Was that the latest one? I, th I don't know if it's the latest. That's a good, that's a good trivia question. Oh, that's the one I remember. Because I do remember, like, in our lifetime, there's been a couple marshmallows added. Yes. Yeah. Like, what is the what is the original Lucky Charms marshmallows? Well, I remember oh, he would talk diamonds. Those diamonds, horseshoes, right? rainbows, rainbows, horseshoes, uh, clovers, clovers, clovers. I think that was the the ones. And That's then it. After that, they started adding. And them. then remember, he's on the red balloon. It's a red balloon. And yeah. Then they What's the what are the the uh, blues? The moon, right? Yeah. I, I just so. remember my brother would beat me. Um, in the morning, he would not, you wouldn't beat me. Uh, he, he would beat me to get the cereal in the morning, and he would literally like eat every one of the marshmallows. So I would just pick, one by I would one. Pick the marshmallows and then out I would go pour it. myself a bowl. I'm just like, where? Like, I only have like a couple marshmallows. It, and then I finally caught him one morning, just like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> eating all the marshmallows. Like, no. who does that? Psychotic. I did, bro. I used to, but I wouldn't eat them by themselves. What I'd do is what, I'd pour a bowl of cereal, and then I'd reach in and get, you know. Extra marshmallows? Yeah, extra marshmallows inside. <laughs> hey, do you guys think you that. You asshole. <laughs> do you guys think Lucky Charms could make an all marshmallow cereal? Do you think they could do that? Like, just marshmallows. They should. I yeah. bet there is a, I bet there's a, already something like that. Because I that's saw. That's like a, that's like the market. So, like, you know, Cheez-Its, right? Yeah. So, every now and then, they'd mess up, and they'd have, like, a burnt one. And people were like, I love the burnt ones. They made just burnt versions. No, they didn't. Yes. They, they made burnt cheeses? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. That's funny. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think somebody had, we were out I like like the camping burnt ones. and somebody had it. I was like, what? Hey, it, they did that with like Starburst. I saw at the gas station the other day. It was like just the red ones. I'm like, well, yeah, of course, because everybody's always like, give me the red one. So yeah. Just red ones. <laughs> just, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. Read speaking your room. of other cool shit. Doug, did you see, maybe you can pull this up so the guys can see this. The, and uh, I don't know if there's more than one of these or there's only one, is uh, real life Mario Kart. Oh, this oh, is so cool. Yeah, so it's video. basically go-karts, but then they have like on the on the, on the the ground, I don't know how they do this, and the cars have to have some sort of connection to some sort of digital screen that's shooting on there because you can like, you know, leave bananas and shoot rockets. And then their car turns off. Yeah, and then it hits yeah. and it hits and it makes their car stop for a second. It stalls you, literally. Yes. I thought that's that so, so cool, that dude. That is so cool. Isn't that cool? I, w I want to find that place. I, I know. Want, find yeah. out where it's at, Doug, so we can all go. That. That's a good That's a good team building exercise right there. Yeah. Andrew, yeah, so if you can figure it out. There's one in Universal Studios. Uh, Hollywood is supposed to do it in 2023. I'm Luigi, just so you guys know. They have it in Japan. And uh, you're Bowser. Like Niagara Falls as well. So. <laughs> you're 100 percent Bowser. Bowser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are Bowser, dude. You totally no. are. You look like Bowser right no, now, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you fucking look like Bowser. Dude. Hey, Doug's Toad. <laughs> Doug is Toad. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, He's the cool little guys. mushroom guy. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Psychedelic. He's gonna, uh, I don't want to piss off Doug. Anyway, all right, fly Mario Luigi. Yeah. I see it. Dude, I got, a, I got a hack. I got a parenting hack for you guys. Oh, I love those. Uh, yeah, that, you know, I, I, pe I know people are going to be like, oh, I already knew that. I never really figured He's like, out, you so. should create your children like you do your dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. You could go anywhere. You go to dinner with your wife, put them in the crate, put a little food. No, so, uh, so my youngest... <laughs> If he hears like a rapper or something go off yeah, in the yeah, house, he'll right. find me, right? Yeah. He'll come find yeah, me. And then bell. whatever I'm eating, he wants to have some. Even yeah. if it's the same thing, I got to give him some. So it's this thing, right? So I don't, I don't know what we were eating. And it wasn't really spicy at all, 
But there was, I think there was a little bit of black pepper in the bite that I gave him. Yeah. So we ate it, and then poor kid, he's like, ah, I need to drink the water, right? <laughs> so I'm like, ooh, it's spicy, it's oh, spicy. Yeah. Oh, you got to drink it spicy. Didn't want any more. So I'm like, wait yeah, a So minute. now you tell him all the, all the foods. Yeah, he's I'll eat some. <laughs> oh, papa. And I'll be like, it's spicy. And he <laughs> walks away. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's spicy now, dude. <laughs> dude, I had a, I had a dad uh, moment uh, the other day that was like, oh, it like, took everything in me not to cry. Like it was. So I, we're at that phase now. I've, I've told you guys that Max is like starting to put several words together and stuff. Katrina and I went for like this long old hike the other the other day, and I had like it was like I don't know two long hike for me two and a half hours or something like that. Right, we were walking. We first pushed him in the stroller. He took a nap. Then he woke up, mm -hmm. and then we kept walking. And her and I were talking and stuff. It was a beautiful day out by our place. <clears throat> and I was I had just deadlifted like the day before, and I don't know if like when you go for a long walk after like a good deadlifting session, my hips were all tight and locked up, and so my back is starting to get stiff, and I'm like, okay, it's time for us to like head back to the house. I need to do some stretching or something because I'm start my back start to lock up. Well, Max gets out of the stroller and he wants to walk, so we let him walk for a while, and then he's like, he always does this thing where he he'll he'll walk real fast and he'll get in front of me and then he'll just put his arms up and mm -hmm. then like, just it's like second nature for me to pick him up. And Katrina was already telling him, all right, if, if you walk, daddy's not going to carry you. You walk, you walk. Okay. Okay. And then he'll walk for a little bit and try and do it. And she'd be like, no, Max, no, she keeps telling him. And he's just too cute. He does it like three times to me. And finally, yeah, you gotta, and yeah so I pick, I, I pick him up and Katrina looks at me and she kind of rolls her eyes. She goes, you just, I just told him not to do that. And he, he wraps his arms around me and says, I love you, daddy. Oh, <laughs> Just whoa. <laughs> yeah, wow. dude. That was like the first time he'd like wow. put it all together yeah. like that. Yeah, and that's it, the first time he said that. Yeah, just, like oh. like that. Like he's he's said like part, but like this like in a moment like that where I wasn't coaching him to yeah. say it or do it. And then I didn't want it. Okay, I pick him up. Worth he, oh, I did. It's exactly yeah. exactly what I said to Has her. Has he told you that? She goes, honey, you're, she goes, honey, you're back. I said, worth it. You know, it's yeah. for sure yeah. worth it. I was like, oh, oh my God, man. dude. It's, these moments Boom. happen. Like I know I get home. <laughs> Aurelius, here's my car. So then I'll see him open the door and he's super excited. And just, just small things like that are just such a big deal, you know? It really reminds you to stay present because oh, you miss that shit. I, you know, a long time ago, uh, we shared it on the podcast and, it, you know, I don't know if we've, we've revisited it or whatever with that, but I'll tell you, one of the more impactful things for me as a father and a husband that I ever heard was that conversation that Joe Joe Rogan had with um, Jordan Peterson. Oh yeah, where he says that. Remember when Jordan Peterson talked about comparing like how we as humans prepare for a vacation for a yeah, week or yeah. like that? It's like you spend weeks and months planning it, sometimes a year in advance, yep. and you know shopping for the hotels, the rental car, the restaurant. I mean, it's like all this effort into this thing that is only going to be brief moment yeah, yeah five yeah five days of your life yeah twice right? a year right yeah or once a year even right. you know what i'm saying or one time you're gonna do it right and then he's like you will come home and you will see your wife and kid or whatever and that 15 minute window how impactful it is the way you enter in that house to what you say to your wife yep. what you say to your kid and that that time multiplied over days in the week over months and years in your life is like an eternity in comparison to yeah. that. And it's like, yet we spend zero time thinking about that or putting effort mm -hmm. into making it good. And that like hit me like a ton of bricks mm -hmm. of like, oh my God, how many times do I like storm into the house from and still thinking work? And I mean, and like, so, you know, it's a common practice for me still to this day. And I'm not, a hundred, I'm not batting a hundred on it, but no, it's hard. It's the, cha this is the eternal challenge for parents. I've, I've, I've decided it's that it's the, how do I stay present? in the moment with my kid because it's stressful. They're demanding. You work. You have bills. Like, I, I, I did this with uh, this other thing where Aurelius, he likes to, he likes, when, when, he, when we make him eggs, he likes to stir the eggs. We showed him that he can stir the eggs so now he wants to do that. So now his, he comes up to me and he does the stirring sign. That means he wants to ma make eggs. So this time I said, I'm going to have him do every step of the, I don't care if it takes 45 minutes. This is like, what am I going to do? Hurry up and make eggs so I can play with him later. Might as well do it with while we're making the eggs. So every step of the process, get make sure you get the eggs out of the fridge, bring them over here, crack it on the pan. We did the whole process, and he was so happy to be doing that. Afterwards, mm -hmm. gives me a hug, and I'm like, oh, why don't I do that kind of stuff more? Yeah. And then you go into the shame thing as a parent. Why don't I do that more often? So, all right. <laughs> I, uh, and my wife reminds yeah. me, don't make yourself feel bad. Just try to do it again. Like, no, you just got to – I mean, I think the advice that Arthur Brooks gave that one time on our show where he – you know, I think he was in a cab, right, with yeah. some guy, and some guy was asking him about, you know, like what's the – what's like one tip to being a great father or whatever, and he, his response was, you already did it. 
because he's thinking about oh, yeah. it. So just a simple fact that you care, you're aware of yep. that, you want to be a good father and stuff like that, you're already winning 50% of the battle. So yep. I know that I'm not, a, I, I know I don't bat 100 and I know I definitely can come into the house and be that guy, but it is something that I'm aware of more than I ever was before. That's why that was such a huge moment for me hearing that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I have never thought about that. So I try and practice when I pull in the driveway to just kind of, Take a brief moment and just remind yourself. Yeah, just remind yeah. myself. I'm about to walk in. I'm irritated, maybe for because of this or that. Like my wife and kid have nothing to do with that, yeah. and so I don't want them to feel that. And so when I come in, I need to, you know, feel give them a different energy. Yeah. And boy, I had a stupid argument with Sal about search and seizure no, <laughs> without a warrant. <laughs> Damn it! You're really making me angry. Hey, check this out. There's a company we work with called PRX that makes home gym equipment that is as good or better than the gym, the equipment you find at the gym, except this stuff is designed to take up minimal space. For example, they have a squat rack that literally folds into the wall, comes off the wall by about that much. It's like uh, maybe uh, six inches to 12 inches off the wall. Then you pull it out. You got a full squat rack. You got safeties. It handles a lot of weight. I mean, it's, it's super sturdy. It's super awesome. They have weight plate uh, racks that hang on the wall. I mean, all their equipment is designed for home use. But again, it's super high quality. You could also pay monthly on their equipment. So it's like having a gym membership, except it's at home. You got to check this company out. We've outfitted all of Mind Pump Studios with PRX stuff because we like their stuff so much. Head over to prxperformance.com forward slash Mind Pump, and you'll get a 5% discount automatically at checkout. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Jonah from Colorado. Jonah, good to see you again, man. How you doing? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised you rem remembered me, Sal. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. I've talked to you like four times. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I was I was thinking about when I got on here. I was like, it's good to see you guys again. But uh, thanks for having me on. It's it's really I really really appreciate it. What can we do? Um. So yeah, I'll get right into it. Um. You know, I've been doing uh, coaching for three years now. I uh, played college football. My well, I played football all the way through college. Uh, tried to play, be a professional. When that didn't really go anywhere. I, uh, I wanted to get to the point of understanding why I was never able to push myself to the level that I wanted to, why my body was always in chronic pain, which led me to get six certifications in uh, personal training, nutrition, and behavior change, and then allowed me to be a, a personal trainer at the, the center that trained me, then went to 24-hour fitness, and then now became an online coach, um, helping people get in shape and and really reestablish their 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 love for themselves and their fitness. Um, and I, I got in the best shape of my life, even better shape than when I was a college athlete. And it's been absolutely phenomenal. And that's why I love doing what I do. And coaching is what I meant to do. That's why I listen to you guys all the time. And being able to meet you guys has been awesome. Um, so my question really is, I I meant to do this, but I'm having a hard time being a part of multiple coaching groups. Right, I met you at the NCI event, and I want to. I just want to pick your brain on understanding the line between me being able to be a better coach and but and the person being ready to make the appropriate change necessary to see uh, the changes that they want. If that if that makes sense. So like uh, like how far do you push them? Or are you talking about yourself no. personally? You're talking about yourself personally with going through all the coaching and then applying it to yourself. Uh, so kind of in the in the sense of like, there's, there's two schools of thoughts out there, uh, at, at least from my perspective, right? Where coaches are able to really connect with their clients and see the results um, or help them see the results they want. And then there's another school of co uh, coaches that like the client doesn't want it bad enough. And I'm in the this weird mixed mixed up land of understanding like where that line is like if I can't reach a certain person and I know I'm not going to be the right coach for everybody, but is there a line where I need to be become a better coach or just have understand that 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 person may not be ready to make the changes that they need to see? Well, yeah. both both schools of thought are correct because I mean there's there's going to be people that just aren't going to make the change and then there's going to be people that are challenging that requires you to be a better coach. So I don't think that one school of thought is more right than the other. I yeah. think they both. Well, I, I would say number one is um, it's always your fault yeah. if you're the coach. So it's always your fault. Number two is accept the stuff that you can do and, and what you can't do. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, first, set some boundaries. And the best time to do this is, is when you first get a client. So listen, um, here are my policies now that you're hiring me. You, if, you, if you cancel, you got to give me at least 24-hour advance notice. Otherwise, you lose your session. If you do this you know, more than two times in a month or whatever you decide is right for you, then you'll lose your spot or you could potentially lose your spot. Ultimately, the results are up to you. I can't work out for you. I can't eat for you. I can't change behaviors for you. I'm here as a guide. So ultimately, the results are up to you. And you set the boundaries. Mm. And then you respect your boundaries. But beyond that, you can't force somebody to do anything. Yeah, and and you got to figure it. this you got to figure this out for yourself where your boundaries are. I know for me, I had a realization where it was like, look, if the client's showing up twice a week to see me uh, and then they're you know eating bad on their own or whatever, so they're not losing weight, if they didn't train with me, there's they wouldn't even work out. So I, I'm doing something. For me, that was my that was okay with me. But if they no showed me or they canceled a bunch of times in a row, that was my boundary. Like, look, at least respect my time. I have a business. And there's other people that could fill up that space. So, so you, you got to set those boundaries and then just honor those. But at the end of the day, it's all your fault, which means if it doesn't work out, you got to accept it. Look, I couldn't figure out how to get to this person. I couldn't figure out how to work with them. And that's fine. That's okay. We're going to have to move on. There, there's also levels to this, right? Like when you first, when you're scaling, like you are right now, I remember like the first couple of years of, of training clients, like. I, I would say I probably had a mix, I don't know, of 50-50. 50 percent of the clients I really enjoyed training because they they would apply the things I told them. Uh, the other 50 percent were, you know, kind of a headache, inconsistent, lied about stuff, could never get them to follow all the stuff. And at that point in my career, I was I was a little held hostage to still keeping those people on my roster because I needed to build a business. But over time, what happens is one, you get better at your craft, setting the boundaries like Sal was saying, and then taking responsibility as the coach of getting better. Also recognizing too that uh, some people just getting them to show up is a massive win, right? And you're already impacting their life there. So also understand that, right? Like not everybody is gonna is gonna be like hardcore measure away their food, show up every single day, like check in like they're supposed to. Some people just aren't there yet. And as a coach, you gotta kind of meet them where they're at. And, you know, and Sal tells a story that he's told on the podcast probably a hundred times about the lady that it took him two years just to get to read one page, one nutrition page, you know, a day was, and that was like a huge leap. You know what I'm saying? Like he couldn't get her to follow a diet for two years because she was just so uh, opposed to even following anything like that. And then he finally at least got her to accept you know, reading one page two years later. So understand that you're going to have a, a wide range of people at all different levels and a good coach can meet those clients and, and set goals for them that stretch them a little bit, but aren't so overwhelming that they're just not going to adhere to it whatsoever. So you're trying to find that juggle. And then as you get better at doing this and your roster gets more consistent and filled with the people you like, then you can kind of be a little picky and choosy. Then you'd build a reputation like, I, once I got to a place where I'd been doing this for a long time, I'd built this reputation that you couldn't even train with me until you submitted all the, almost like an application to me. Like you had to apply to train with me. Part of that application process was you had to track your own food for two weeks, do these pictures. Like you had to do all this stuff before I would even take money from you. So you can start. And then that, what that did for me was like, it weeded out all the people that weren't serious. Like if you weren't willing to do that on your own before you're even paying me, then you're not even ready to, to become a client of mine. And so, but you can't, trying to do that when you're also scaling is also challenging. So I understand. And you may have different boundaries. Like that mm -hmm. was Adam's boundary. Right, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. At that point in your career, right? Yeah, it changes. I mean, in the beginning too, you need the clients, you need the volume, you need the practice. So uh, to deal with all these different personalities is definitely a tough part of the job that you're going to have to navigate through. Uh, and to be able to reach them and tell them and communicate what they need to hear in the most simplistic form uh, from the beginning, you're just going to get better at that and, and you know, clearly conveying that uh, from the beginning so that way you get that kind of buy-in. But, uh, I mean, honestly, everything has to be clear up front, like whatever it is that, uh, you know, is in terms of your boundaries, in terms of the expectations of everything going into it. And then you can't control the rest other than just trying to communicate your best and, and feed them information that they need. Yeah, and it really, a lot of it depends on, look, if I was training a bunch of people who were going to compete in a bodybuilding competition or athletes um, in a sport or, you know, something very serious where there's a targeted goal or whatever, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, you're, you don't show up and you're not serious. You're, I'm, you're out. I'm not working with you, right? Or off the team or whatever. 
if I'm training the everyday average person, it's totally different. The context is different. I'm looking at, for me at least, okay, this was me, right? I, I want to be able to change this person's life, right? I want to be able to help them develop a relationship with exercise and nutrition that will last them the rest of their life. That's a long timeline. So, you know, Adam talks about it took two years with this one client and I had clients that took them four years to lose 30 pounds, right? But then after that, like they, they kept it off for the next 10 years, right? We're still on, now we're on year 10 and these people haven't gained the weight back. So the timeline is different. Individuals are different. And the, I think the key is this, is, you know, I, you, you really got to love people. And I, what I mean is I don't mean feel love for them. Is I don't always feel love for my clients, but I actively love them in the sense that I was honest. You know, I have a friend right now who's dealing with a 20, uh, 22-year-old kid, who their son, who's abusing drugs and alcohol. And and we had this conversation over it. And, and they were advised to, to kick him out. And they, they said, we can't. We love him. And the therapist said, look, that means you have to create what they said. You have to create a bottom. You have to, you, they have to hit bottom. You have to create that. And so loving them means you have to tell them they can't stay there anymore. You have to create these boundary type of deals. So how does this apply to what I'm talking about with clients? You can, you can be very honest. You know, John, the reason why you're not losing weight is because you refuse to do everything that I tell you. Yeah, like that's honest. But then there's compassion. I get it. It's hard. When you're ready, you let me know. You see? And then you have your boundaries. John, look, you, you no-showed on me. Remember, if you no-show on me again, I got to give that to somebody else who's willing to respect my time. Like, I would talk to my clients this way that I had relationships with who I trained for 10 years. You know, you could be very honest and compassionate at the same time, and it was very effective. And some people just take a long time, and you got you to look at them and, and, and the individual and say, okay, what's a win for them? Like, okay, you know... She's not eating, uh, you know, a bag of potato chips every day. That's a big deal for her. Like she's been doing that for the last year that I've been with her. She just stopped doing that. Like that's a that's a big or or they're showing up. They're showing up every single time to their workouts on time. Everything else isn't great, but before that they weren't even doing that. So, but that was me, right? So you have to paint that for yourself. Be solid. Communicate those boundaries, and then be consistent with them with empathy and honesty. And what you'll find is you'll be very effective. You're not going to be 100 percent effective. It's just it's just not. But you will be more effective. I want to touch on something that Justin said that I think is really important because it reminds me of even leading trainers, just being in the leadership role. Period, which you are as a coach, you're leading this person or these people. And that was the laying out the clear expectation. There was a clear a shift in my career as a as a manager leading other trainers when I'd have this challenge, like after I've had this this trainer working for me for six months and they weren't doing some of the things that I wanted to do. And it was why it was always challenging for me was because I just expected that they knew that they would see their peers, what yeah. their peers were mm -hmm. doing, that they knew what the job entailed, but I didn't really sit down and like communicate, like here, here's the rules. Here's the way I want things done. And, and that was, so it always made these awkward conversations and I was always in limbo and I let them stay on the staff too long and they got mad at me and they had resentment when I'd sit them down six months later and tell them they were doing these things wrong. And it, that shift was, it became very important that when I hired somebody on, I had this, this conversation that I had practiced over time that became very scripted of like, okay, here are my expectations for you as a trainer working for me. The same thing that you would do with a client and laying that out makes these future conversations that Sal and jo Justin are both talking about much easier. If you don't do a good, if you don't hold yourself accountable to having these, these boundaries like Sal's talking about, and then like Justin's talking about laying it out clearly at the very beginning of them hiring you, then you're going to be in these weird, awkward situations where you're like, oh, I just assume that mm. they knew they were supposed to do these things that I said, or I just assume that they would listen to me. It's like, no, don't assume, sit down and be very clear from the beginning, your expectations of this, this coaching session or coaching journey with you. And then it'll be much easier to have those follow up those follow up uh, conversations later. Yeah, does that does that does that help yeah. you a little bit? That helps so much. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of what I what I what I thought I I knew you guys were going to say it, but hearing it sounds so much. And it's the exact reason why I listen to you guys, and I try to emulate your guys' coaching as much as I can in my own. Um, so yeah, that helps a lot, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jonah. Yeah, thanks for calling right. in, man. Yeah, it was good seeing you guys. Talk to you soon. You, you too, guys. man. All right. Yeah, I think it's important, too, to communicate that um, it's a hard job. 
Yeah. Okay, so... Dealing with humans is hard. Listen, I want to be very clear here, okay? Uh, the three of us did this for over two decades, lots of experience. We were all in our space, right? In our local areas, definitely considered some of the more successful trainers. And our fail rate was more often than not. So yeah. the truth is, as a coach, helping people change their life and, uh, and change their behaviors... Even if you kill it and you crush it, you're going to fail more often than not. Now, you'll do a lot better than the average coach, and they'll do a lot better than if they try to do it on their own. Mm. But it's just, there's a lot of fails. So you really have to love this, and you have to be very, very smart about how you approach your boundaries, how things are communicated, who you're working with. Otherwise, it's going to be, it's it can be so frustrating. It can be, and a lot of coaches and trainers quit. Yeah. They quit over something like this because... They can't figure it out, and they're like, "This is too hard. Nobody wants to do what I, you know, when I tell them or whatever." I mean, it's hard. Well, this is a very common question for new trainers coming in because the passion is so high, and uh, you know they want to change people's lives. They want people to, um, you know, adhere to this plan that they put together and everything to work out the way that they see it in this vision for this client of theirs that they're so passionately trying to move them towards, um, and. It is. It's. It's very tough uh, to to get to a place where you can communicate clearly what how this is going to go, and also like be able to predict somewhat based on somebody's personality. Um, oh, that's a good one. You yeah. know what <laughs> what types of directions to steer them a little bit or focus on. Uh, you know to get them to um, at least move a little bit closer towards that vision you have for them. But it's reps. At the end of the day, like it's going to be hard. There's going to be like clients that. Don't come back. There's going to be flaky clients. There's going to be a lot of that, uh, you know, initially. Uh, and, and it's everything that I've learned in terms of training. And yes, it sucks looking back and being like, oh, I didn't, I didn't help that person very well. And there was like a, you know, a percentage that was a lot higher back then that I probably wasn't reaching. But I was doing the reps. I was doing the work. I was continuously trying to improve. And I think that's really the mindset you got to have. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's a reason for that. And you you hit it right on the head, Justin, that I think is so important. And or at least it resonated with me when you said it, because there's two things I remember as trainers uh, getting started that they, they failed to realize was a big part of the job. One of them we all know is sales. We talk about that all the time. Like you don't sign up to be a, a sales guy or girl, like normally to be a trainer, you want to yeah. help people. And so when it's like, it, and that's such a big part. Of oh, your it's job. such a huge yeah. part of the job. The second huge part of your job that you don't normally sign up for and realize is leadership. You don't, you, you, you may think that, oh, I'm into this like coaching passionate for people, helping people, but learning to be a good leader is a major part of being a good coach. Yeah. You're not just yeah. an information center. No. And you're not just a, a counter or no. a programmer. Like there's a big, you're leading people in a direction yep. and it, and it takes major skill to lead all different types of personalities at all different levels and places in their life. And so that J Justin, what you said is such an important uh, leap in leadership. And I remember that leap for myself, leading trainers, that massive struggle I had, it was, and it was the same exact struggle. It's just like mine was communicating to my, my staff yep. and getting frustrated later to have those conversations. And then, th and then thinking like, man, am I a bad manager? Am I bad at this? Do I not yep. know what I'm doing? It's like, no, what I'm not doing is when they, our first interaction together, that first day they meet me as their boss, I'm not doing a good job of laying out the expectations and you can never over communicate that. So I learned mm -hmm. to communicate that really well. And then those follow up conversations were actually pretty easy because it's, you already said it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times you don't even have to use it. established. That's right. It's already been established. And so I think that's such a, an important. It sets the stage for uh, ownership for them, right? Because they know the expectations, they know they're not meeting the expectations. You do this with a client you don't even have to say anything to you. They come to you. Hey, look, I know I, I, you know, I did that thing. I know I didn't show up. I'm, you know, I apologize. Hey, listen, I got to cancel again. If you need to give my time to someone else, I totally understand because the expectations, uh, you know, they, they were already set, but I, you know, you said something about predicting clients. This happens after a long time, but you develop a superpower. I know we've all talked about this when mm -hmm. you've trained people for a long time where you can sound like a wizard where you could tell them, hey, John, this is what's going to happen. Here's what you're going to feel. Yeah. I know you're this kind of person. And they look at yeah. you like, how do you know? Or and then when it happens, <laughs> oh, my God, you totally rise. Like, well, I've, you know, I've trained like 50 people just like you're you. are like that so guy at the carnival that's like guessing somebody's weight. You yeah, know, right yeah, away, like yeah. right on the money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Our next caller is Nick from Michigan. Nick, what's happening? How can we help you? 
Hey guys, what's going on? Good to meet you. Thanks okay. for uh, thanks for the time. Yeah, you got, it. You got it. Um, so I had a couple questions, so I'll just get right into it. Um, so I do a lot of triathlon, and I know usually that's kind of a sketchy uh, topic, but uh, I recently got into um, more of a consistent strength training about a year ago, and the benefits have been huge. Right, so. Um, now that we're about to kind of wrap up this year, we got one more race in just a few days. Um, I'm looking to kind of switch gears um, over these just cold Michigan winters and uh, ramp up some more strength training. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what the best strategy to do that would be um, as far as more strength, I can hit back hit or cardio or like an apps cardio. I'm also currently right now I'm doing like two days a week strength training. Um, along with all the swimming and the biking, and the running, um, also using, uh, maps prime and then OBS apps. So it's kind of where I'm at now looking at moving forward with some, uh, something else okay nick, nick let's get you map symmetry yeah actually you, you know before we do that because i think that would be a great uh i think that's actually the perfect program for you but what what is your routine going to look like in the winter with your triathlon training how much running so swimming biking to do yeah so typically i mean i i you know it's um it comes down quite a bit as far as how much you know i'll be pool swimming probably once or twice a week just to kind of maintain um say cycling will really drop off once the snow flies here. Um, I don't do a whole lot of indoor cycling. It's mind numbingly boring unless you have like one of those super high tech, um, trainers, but they don't, um, running probably two, three days a week, maybe, but the volume and the distances that I'll be running and intensity will, will definitely come down just to kind of let my body recover from all that Let's constant. Let's get more specific, Nick, because I've trained a, 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 a quite a few triathletes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your lo, your low level is well, like I'm just going to run like 50 miles yeah, a week, yeah, no uh, big deal. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I right. trained. No, no, that's cool. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so typically, you know, like the, this last this next event is a half iron last year with a full iron. So, um, as far as like weekly mileage would go, probably 10 to 15 miles a week running. Um, maybe spend, you know, an hour or two a week in the pool, uh, throughout the winter. Okay. Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. So, you know, I think you should do, um, I mean, map symmetry would be good. Maps anabolic would be fine too. I think you should continue doing two days a week of strength training. I don't think you should add more. Yeah. I think you should take that time to allow your body to, to build, recuperate. I, I, like I said, triathlon training is, um, it's a lot. You're training three disciplines. You have to get very technical with all three disciplines, um, and it's it's obviously very stamina and endurance focused. Mm -hmm. So it's very very intensive. The off season needs to be the off season, and you'll actually get better results in season if you treat off season like you're trying to allow your body to to rest, repair, and and build. And if if what you do is scale the the triathlon training down, but then ramp the strength training way up. You're not going to really do that, so I think you should keep the strength training, strength training twice a week. Twenty. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I saw, I saw a pooty tat. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that, that that dates us. By the way, does anybody know that? <laughs> yes. so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it. I'm like the same age as you. Yeah, guys, I was just saying, so. Nick, Nick gets yeah. it for yeah, sure. I would keep it. I would keep it twice a week. But twice you, a week. But symmetry, though, um, right? Yeah, yeah, symmetry would be good. Symmetry yeah, twice a week. I love symmetry. And then if you mentioned uh, maps anabolic, uh, one thing I would love to see is if you could like replace the trigger sessions with the mobility sessions from performance if possible but well, he's gonna get that in symmetry but he's gonna get that in symmetry yeah. so there's but yeah, yeah continue I, I that on that i just haven't really got into it yet so i haven't really looked at it i have access to it to anabolic right now okay yeah well, actually that's something to bring up we do uh highlight the um the frequency builder type of, of workouts from each program from uh, maps performance, maps anabolic, and maps aesthetic. So uh, that's actually something that we included in that program, just so the audience knows uh, deliberately. Uh, so it, it'll show you kind of like our thought process through that. Yeah. Before before we wrote map symmetry, I would say maps anabolic would have been a great call for you to go to. So your your mindset is right, but I just think symmetry is even more applicable to you. I just think you're going to get way more benefits. Being a runner, swimmer, the unilateral work. 
and isometric work yeah. that's in there, especially you trying to kind of deload and recover. The beginning of that program is mostly isometric. And so that's going to give you that uh, recovery that you need. And then you move into unilateral work, which I think is going to be super beneficial for all the sports that you're doing. So uh, yeah. that's, that's the program. And to Sal's point, I would just scale back one of the days. So it, it's, it comes with three days a week, but I would be, I would pull back to two days a week uh, because of your uh, all the other stuff that you're doing and allow yourself to recover and resist the temptation to want to do more because you know you can do more. That'll be the challenge for you is because you're so used to a such a high volume of training, initially you're going to yeah. feel like, oh, this feels like nothing. Yeah. I mean, even like, and you're way more high volume than my wife is. And when I had her run Symmetry and I've had her run programs like Starter, she's always going like, oh, I could do more. It's like, I know you can do more. It's not about what you can do. It's what you should do. And so, you know, you're going to resist that temptation to want to do more when you know you can. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, I totally get that. When, when I was training for Ironman, it was more about, it was a lot of volume, it was a lot of time spent training, but it was also knowing how to hold back enough to, to be able to go out and do it tomorrow. That's right. And the yeah. next day, and the That's next right. day, and the next day. So, all right. And I think I could, right, second, I think I could manage that. You had a second part of the question about low hemoglobin? I did. So, um, I tend to, I like to, donate blood like twice a week, twice a year. Um, uh, it was cool. I think it was you guys that heard that the benefits that I get from yeah. donating blood, which is pretty cool. But, uh, if you ever go donate blood, you see, they track your, you, they track all your hemoglobin. And I noticed as I, you know, over the years dialed in my nutrition, got fitter, my hemoglobin levels would go up, up, up. And then this last time it actually went down and I can't, I couldn't figure out looking back, like what, what happened? What's so different now that I did, you know, if it was, I can't imagine, I can't think of anything in my diet or my uh, fitness level that would have changed it. I don't know if you guys have any insight as far as what other factors other than the obvious ones, uh, maybe even the obvious ones that could cause that to drop. I'm not, I'm still kind of in the normal level, but it went from like, I was at 15.1 and it dropped to 13.1 from the fall to the spring. Now I'm going to be going back probably to donate here in the next few weeks. I'm kind of curious where it's going to be, but. I don't know if you guys have any insight how, on how long have you been donating, at all. How long have you been donating blood? Uh, about five years. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't donate blood once or twice. That'll make it. That'll probably make it uh, go back up. Um, I, obvi the obvious things need to be checked. So I would check iron. I would look at B vitamin uh, uh, intake or absorption. Uh, you know, blood levels, and then yeah. uh, look at your digestion. Make sure you don't have any digestive issues, ulcers, or inflammatory issues, can because that can cause some of those issues. But I, I would, I, I, yeah, donating blood. I think if you skipped a session, you'd probably see it go up. Get in our form. Is the obvious one. Get in the get in the uh, yeah. MP Holistic Health form. Yeah, have you? I don't have uh, social media. At oh, all, oh, so okay. have you gotten your good Got for it. you by the way? Yeah, have yeah. you gotten your uh, yeah. your iron levels checked? I have not. Oh. I have not, but it would probably be a good idea. I'm kind of curious what it's going to be this time around because it had been trending up until last spring. So, and like I said, my wife, I got a wife that works at the, in the, she's a scientist at the hospital. I thought, you know, you could just give me a bag of some be positive, but she wasn't on board with that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah go get, grab it from go, the back. go see what your, um, go see what your iron levels look like. That'd be the most obvious uh, thing. And then uh, if, if they are in fact a bit low, you, you know, eat some, some liver, uh, some organ meats. I mean, you could supplement with iron too, although that tends to mess with people's digestion. Um, and you can yeah. really overdo it that way. But, uh, I would get, go get some blood work done. Make sure it's not a nutrient deficiency. That's usually the first, uh, I mean, that's usually, that's usually what it is. If, if there is in fact an issue with, with hemoglobin. Okay. Yeah. Right on. You, you awesome, got it, man. Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for calling in. Hey, okay. appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. You got it. Yeah. So is it possible that the that those levels are off be, because of like the timing of when he gets his blood drawn compared totally. to like his training? Like if he was like like one time he gets his blood done and it was like maybe moderate training from because he's such an intense yeah. high volume trainer and running and stuff like that. Like well, at training like that should have a positive effect um, on he, on hemoglobin. Giving blood will lower it, uh, and then it takes I don't know how long it takes to replace it. This is why they say it's a good thing for men to give blood because we don't have a, a monthly menstrual cycle like women do. And so if we tend to build up iron stores, sometimes, not tend to, mm. some some men will have higher iron stores or they'll get too much of certain nutrients that they need to kind of get rid of. This is why they call it Iron Man. 
Iron Man. That's yeah. good, Justin. I, I got it. That's now. great. Yeah, yeah. Just mind blow. <laughs> it's exploded. Just had an epiphany here. But too. I mean, you know, it, I, nutrient deficiencies are first. Second would be internal bleeding, uh, ulcers, or digestive issues. Third would be an issue with your uh, with your bone marrow, which could be something bad. Obviously, okay. So six to twelve weeks hmm. it takes to to bring back the hemoglobin. So I mean, it could take. It could it could be a thing. So. I, I would get I would get those things checked for and since he didn't do his blood work um or, and know what his nutrient levels are, that's probably if there is an issue, that's probably where it's at. Our next caller is David from New Jersey. David, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Gentlemen, good to be with you. You too. So uh like about you your guys' age, I'm a forty three year old male, uh about six one, 176 pounds. I've been training since I was fifteen years old, basically got into weightlifting uh start of my sophomore year of high school. I started with typical bodybuilding type split training, which I did throughout my youth and in my 20s. Then in my 30s, I got more into endurance sports and I was competing in marathons and triathlons and then eventually just bicycle racing. Uh, then COVID hit and there were no more races on the calendar. So that kind of got me back into strength training. I do have a set of uh, power block dumbbells, you know, adjustable five to 90 pounds. And that was just enough equipment with, with a bench to kind of keep me going. Uh, through COVID. Um, so, you know, with that, I just got really back into to strength training. Uh, I feel like with my experience, I've always known enough to design my own programs. Uh, but then that was around the same time I was starting to listening uh, to you guys' podcasts. And so I'd never followed a program that was designed by somebody else. But after a few months of listening to you guys, I said, you know what, let me give it a try. So uh, kind of fast forward to this past spring around April uh, I started MAPS Anabolic, and at the same time, for the first time ever, I started tracking my macros, which again was a consequence of listening to you guys. Uh, so it was sort of interesting. I used the calculator that you guys have on the website just to kind of ballpark. I had no idea where I might be, and that told me, you know, around 2,900 calories. So I, was start, I started at about 190 pounds, and then over the first few phases of Anabolic, with 2,900 calories, I dropped down to 178 pounds, which I was fine with. I really was like, let me just see where this takes me. Let me learn. And obviously I cut some body fat before the summer. So I was cool with that. Um, then, you know, I didn't want to continue to drop weight. So I started to take your guys' advice, I think, and start to bump up my calories very gradually, first up to 3,100, then 32, then 33. I'm currently at 34. And my weight has sort of plateaued, like I'm right around 176, give or take a half a pound on, on either side. Um, so I feel good about that. Uh, and I'm really just wondering, you know, at my age, looking out over the next decade or so. So my first question is about about nutrition. You know, how malleable you guys talk about, you know, reverse diet, and I'm, I guess I'm sort of doing that now, like, how malleable is it? And what is the ceiling? Like how high a guy my size, my activity level uh, and I should say, I finished anabolic. I'm doing performance now, and I and I do walk typically about 10,000 steps a day. So my first question is, you know, I like to eat a lot. So how high can I go, and anything else I can do to get it there? Yeah, uh, you're kicking ass, dude. Yeah, yeah you're doing you're, great. You yeah. really are. Your limit is 4,273 <laughs> and a half calories. I, yeah. Actually, <laughs> let I, me write that down. Hold yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. No idea. Point but two five. No idea. It's so there's such a huge uh, variance between people. But um, I mean, there, I, I've seen pretty wild. I've seen some big swings, man. Oh, I swing massively. Yeah, I've I mean, seen them, and I've seen it myself. I've seen them in clients. Uh, I, I remember I had a young lady who was eating a thousand calories. We got her up to eating like 2,600 calories and reduced her, her activity even, and she got leaner. Um, you know, I, I can get my calories up to, gosh, if I want to really bulk, I got to get like five or 6,000 calories at some point. So it's really, it depends on the person. So I don't know, but I, 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 I'd say 3,400 calories, 176 pounds. You look pretty damn lean um, on screen. I would assume you're probably no more than 12, 13% body fat, the highest. Am I, am I right in the range? What body fat percentage? Yeah, you know, there? I use calipers and I, I take, uh, I use the Jackson Pollock formula leader, and I kind of plug mm -hmm. in the, the three location four and seven. I know it's not perfect because I'm doing some measurements to myself and like occasionally I have my wife like do like, you know, my back and so on. Uh, so, you know, that always puts me around five or 6%. I mean, oh, I'm shit. pretty lean. Oh, You're uh, shredded, bro. 
Yeah, yeah, you got a lot of room, dude. Yeah, I, 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 you go. For, I, I'd say I would bump your calories five hundred easy. Yeah, yeah easily bump five hundred. You know, here's the thing that I think you're gonna you'll eventually run into this because you are really lean. You're a big guy too, and you're active, so you got plenty of room to go. I bet you can get all the way forty five hundred plus calories. Yep. yep. So it and this happens. Sal and I talk about this a lot off air because this is like our thing where we're always you know trying to get bigger and pushing the calories, and then what ends up happening is you start to see some side effects. One of my side effects is I start snoring. I start feeling a lot of inflammation because I'm pushing the, I'm building muscle. And there's comes to a point where your frame, you're, you know, you just weren't made to carry any more muscle and you're starting to wrestle with that. And on top of that, you find yourself kind of stuffing yourself food wise and you're not just, you're just like forcing it. Yeah. And so I think the sweet spot that I'm always looking for is I've ramped my metabolism up to a place that anytime I feel like eating, I can definitely eat as long as I make a good choice and balanced nutritious meal. I never have to tell myself I can't eat or I should I should hold back or restrict calories. That's such a good place I feel like to be. And so only you can decide what that is for you. But I, I definitely think you're at a you're at a place where you could definitely ramp calories, especially how lean you are. You yeah, I mean your comment calories. about wanting to be able to eat, because in your notes you wrote, you know, I want to be able to eat, I enjoy food. I mean, you got a lot of room, dude. You got a lot of room. I would bump 500 calories and I bet you'll gain more muscle and maybe a little bit of body fat at that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of, I appreciate that. And my, as I put in the notes, you know, I plan to do aesthetic next and um, I plan to do a bulk. You know, I'm sort of at a point, guys, where like, you know, 190 is kind of like with my genetics and my frame, I can be lean and strong and, and, and that's about as big as I can get in a lean way. And honestly, beyond that, I would need like a whole new wardrobe, which I'm not really <laughs> looking to do anyway. So yeah. I'm looking to bulk up to that like upper 180s, but stay lean. Um, and so I plan to do a, a bulk, you know, when I hit uh, aesthetic. So I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll bump up maybe instead of going in 100 calorie increments. Once I get there, I'll bump three or 400 and hit phase one of aesthetic and, and see where that takes me. Yeah. So that kind of brings me to my other question, which was about I'm currently in performance. And you had a caller just uh, I listened to a, an episode recently that made a similar type of question. But. I'm kind of struggling with, on the one hand, you know, I enjoy it. I'm the kind of guy that like enjoys kicking my own ass kind of thing. And, and that endorphin and dopamine rush of the workout, like I need my daily workout. I love the mobility days, you know, that gets me in the gym. It's not strenuous, but I get, you know, that satisfaction of going to the gym. And I just think those are fun workouts to do. So I think you, you guys did a great job designing those mobility sessions. They're kind of like workouts. They've did, you know, yeah. there's definitely mobility components, but they are slightly stressful, which I kind of like. Anyway, you know, phase one, I liked phase two through four. I'm in phase two right now. I'm struggling with, it feels a little bit like just that, like getting a sweat, burning calories. I don't know where I'm going, you know, so it's a good workout, but I don't know where I'm going. And I'm kind of starting to question, like, should I shorten those phases from three weeks down to two weeks? You know, still do the phases, but just do two weeks. And that way I get to aesthetic sooner. Um, I don't know what you guys think about that or if you would talk me out of that. Uh, but that's sort of where my headspace is at right now. If you follow performance all the way through, you're going to have way better su success with aesthetic afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Phase two is about multiplanar movements and perfecting your form and technique. Mm-hmm. So it's about perfect form, perfect technique, control, stability in different planes of motion. That's that's the key with phase two. It's not bodybuilding. It's not about getting a pump. It's not about lifting the most amount of weight. It's about perfect technique, perfect form. You want to be solid as hell in every direction that you move, and that's what phase two is all about. Yeah, so. I think I, – I, I'm not sure if this is the caller you're referring to, but I know we did just have a caller like this where I was – I, I think it was a female that I was explaining this to that uh, – you got to really shift your mindset in phase two of performance to just that idea of the way we program that it's supposed to be all about quality of movement. And so it tends to be a hard transition for a lot of people that just come out of phase one because you, you're pushing the weight, you're getting stronger. Then all of a sudden you move to this phase where you're doing things like the reverse lunge and the, you know, multi-planar stuff that we have in there. Like, so when you do those things, worry less about the weight and the sweat and the short rest periods and that type of stuff. And actually, you know, try and improve the form. The And that's why you have mobility sessions. You're trying to get a deeper range of motion in that lunge. You you want better stability when you come up from the reverse lunge. You want you want your left to your right side to look equal and perfect. And so become, become obsessed with that 
over than the weight, the sweat, the burn, and that kind of thought. So think about the quality of the movement through that phase, and that's really what you're trying to to be uh, competitive with in that in that phase. Yeah, and to the point of uh, so two weeks versus three weeks, and I, I know there's also a little bit of. Uh, like uh, we've gotten some feedback in terms of like the volumes a little high, you know, on some of these multiplanar movements. And I think it's because it's a foreign type of uh, animal for a lot of people who just stay in the sagittal plane the whole time. And so it's, it's mentally challenging more so than it's physically challenging. Uh, and to be able to get in that headspace, you got to think of it as you're, you're patterning these movements. So you get familiar with them. And so it was intentional that we raise the volume a little bit. So you get more adequate practice. So your, your body responds so much better when there's any kind of shift or it takes you out of, uh, the sagittal plane, when you go back to lifting heavy and getting after it again. All right, I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I, you guys have sort of made a believer out of me. You know, I have to say with anabolic going down to even the three days, like following the advanced calendar, I was a little skeptical because typically I lifted not much more, but four or five days. But, you know, even that reduction uh, and it, I got amazing results from anabolic. So, you know, if you guys tell me to stick it out and do the three weeks, I'm going to give it a shot and I'll do that. If I could just ask one additional question, if you guys don't mind, and Sal, I know you had some experience with this. So I, I also had my testosterone tested uh, a few weeks back. And so I, I don't know what to call it. I guess the regular testosterone range was, was within normal. The free testosterone was below the standard range. And so my GP uh, referred me to an endocrinologist. Um, and so I have an appointment coming up. I wonder if you have any advice for me. Like, I don't know if that, the, the, I don't understand the difference between the, those two measures, yeah. like free testosterone versus the, the, the regular. And like, what, if you have any guidance for me as far as like what questions to ask the doctor or, or what I might expect with yeah, that well, process. They, in our form. Yeah. Get, uh, so we have a form called MP hormones. Um, uh, actually, wait, hold on. Is it mind pump hormones? Mm, mind pump hormones. Mind pump hormones on Facebook. Um, so I'm not a doctor, but I do know that uh, free testosterone is not bound by what's called sex binding globulin hormone. So when testosterone is bound by this, it's really unusable. Okay, so it's just you have high, you have testosterone, but your body can't use it. Once it's free, now you can use it. So you could have high total testosterone, but low free testosterone, and you would suffer. You could suffer the effects of low testosterone, even though total testosterone is within range. So what causes high sex binding uh, globulin hormone? Uh, you know that that's that's a question you would have to ask your doctor. Um, or I ask our doctors. We have two doctors that are actually in that forum daily answering questions. You'll get an answer and, quick And it's there. free to you. Yeah, you'll get an answer real fast if you go there in the, in the forum yeah. and ask those guys. And then if you want to work with a specialist, you go to mphormones.com and get yourself an assessment, have them take a look at everything and, and kind of see what's going on. And I would, I, you know, of course, we're biased because these are the guys that we sought after and think are the best in the industry. But I, I actually went through a different clinic before. And I was very unhappy with the service that I got. Just they weren't able to answer the questions I wanted. They had me on extremely low dose. Uh, and Sal is the one that actually found Dr. Rand and his team and introduced me to you. And they've been and they're way better. So before you maybe go down the rabbit hole with because that's the the GP sends you to somebody. They're going to try all these things. Uh, they're going to be real skeptical to do anything with you. They're going to put they they don't they're not looking to optimize. They're looking like just to get you out of the unhealthy range. And what you'll get with Dr. Rand is they'll they'll allow you to go to a place where you want to optimize, which they they almost did double the dose that I was getting from my other practitioner. And I feel way better uh, with them than I did uh, the other doctor. So, uh, But the forum's free. So uh, you can get in there, ask whatever questions that you have. And then if you want to take the next step and and book an appointment with them, and you can everything can be done virtually. They'll have you go get your blood work. They'll, you'll send it in and then you'll actually have a consultation virtually yeah. with one of the doctors and they'll go over your blood panels with you and then give you your recommendations and it gets shipped right to your door. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I appreciate uh, your time guys. And I appreciate all you do, uh, especially, you know, you guys have made a big impact on my life with mobility following prime uh, and with the nutritional advice you've given me. So it's been really cool to, to follow you guys and uh, I appreciate all your advice. Thanks David. Right Thanks on. David. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, guys. You got it. 
Man, he's such a fan. He started cutting his hair like you. That's really... <laughs> Homeboy shredded, dude. Yeah. It's five, six percent. Yeah, when you said like 12, 13, like, well, that dude ain't no 12, 13 percent. I could tell he was single digits, but uh, I didn't know he was that lean. That's yeah. lean. Well, he was talking about like getting worried about gaining body. So I'm like, I'm, you know, at the highest, he's got to be the maybe 12. Yeah, no, you no. Know, type of deal. He could easily push that yeah. to 4,000 calories, dude, yeah, if he yeah. wants. No, so. you know, the thing you said about the, the hormones, um, I mean, that's a big one because testosterone is a scheduled... Um, drug, right? Uh, because it can enhance athletic performance, they put it in a different category. And because of this, the traditional, I guess, methods of the traditional, you know, doctors, I, I would say, they don't. They, they they're very afraid yeah. to touch it or to or to or to supplement There's a lot it. Of reserve there. Yeah, and um, even though it's an extremely safe hormone to manipulate, much safer than insulin, um, uh, much safer than other hormones, thyroid, for example, that we r routinely prescribe to people who have low thyroid. Uh, but they're, they're afraid. They're afraid to do that. And, and you're right. They'll look in a range and then your symptoms, they don't really ask you questions about that. And, you know, people can be within range and have symptoms because their range should be higher. And other people, you know, they take supplemental testosterone, they take testosterone, they'll be at a high range and it's too much for them. And they got to well, reduce it. I mean, it. Dr. Mm -hmm. Rand explained it so well to me. Like he said, let's, let's imagine all through your teens and twenties, you're used to having 1200 free testosterone. And then over the course of your life, it's dropped down to 600. And then it finally got all the way after you ran what you went through where I ran cycles and so like that it drops me down to 200 and something. And then I go see this general practitioner and they go, oh, okay, we want to get you the normal range. And they bring me back up to five or 600. And he's like, yeah. And you still don't feel great. Like you're better. You're out of the danger yeah. zone of where you were before, but you don't feel like you used to feel. And it's because your body is used to having double of that. And that's a significant difference. And so, and that's not true. By the way, that's not true for everybody. I know people watch mm -hmm. them like, well, yeah, of course, everybody feels, but that's not true. No, there's people who go, they'll go and get prescribed testosterone. And then they'll say, you know, I'm noticing these side. And the doctor's like, well, we got to lower your dose. Yeah. There is a right amount for quality of life. Oh, there's it's not always higher. There's a definite sweet spot. I know, and obviously, because I've competed, I pushed the limits and went up. And there is a, a amount that when I go over that amount, I start getting all the adverse effects. And I do not see the results yeah. or feel the way I want to feel at all. So there is definitely a, a sweet spot. But a lot of these general practitioners, they're all going to weigh on the side of, oh, you don't need it. Or, oh, you don't want to do it. It's like, I'd rather see a hormone specialist. And, and Dr. Rand and them are incredible. Our next caller is Adrian from California. Adrian, what's happening? How can we help you? Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for having me on the show. Huge honor. Awesome. Um, so I started, I ran my MAPS Anabolic once and uh, really liked it, got great results from it. And then you guys had a, a deal on MAPS performance and aesthetic as well. So I took advantage of that. And then, so I ran Anabolic again and then like thinking I was going to do performance and Anabolic after that. And then, um, so I really had fun with it. I had a lot of fun with uh, MAPS performance. And at the start of phase two, I actually started taking creatine. And I think that's kind of where I messed up because I'm not really feeling anything from the creatine. So I just wanted to know, like, how, how do I know it's working and didn't just get ripped off? Um, what are the effects of me taking it irregularly? And what's going to happen when I come off of it? Okay. Mm. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, did you get ripped off? It's unlikely. Creatine now is so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. That if it's pure creatine monohydrate powder, it's most likely going to be creatine monohydrate. I mean, if you got it from a guy in the back of a BMW and around the corner, <laughs> there is there is a chance it's not real. Yeah. Yeah. If you, but if you got it at a local, do not store, buy some any trench coat white powder like that. <laughs> you might get the wrong stuff. No, so um, I mean, you you could always look at the company and see if they have third party testing. It was see. third party tested. Oh, I, I made sure it's yeah. fine. Um, yeah. How do you know it's working? Well, I mean, you, you get a little stronger. Your body weight goes up, maybe a couple pounds. Um, you know, it, is it going to have a profound effect? The, the only way to really know if you're going to have like a, a really measure an effect on a supplement, even one like creatine, which is um, the most studied and backed ergogenic supplement in in history, right, is to yeah. have all the factors be totally controlled. And then you add the supplement. And so this is how you would conduct a study. You keep your diet, your sleep, your workouts exactly the same, add creatine, and then to see if you notice a little bit of a difference. But because you changed phases and things change, it's hard. You don't know what to compare it to. So um, that that's about it. Now, is it working for you? Very likely. A small percentage of people will have issues with creatine. They'll have digestive issues or they're called creatine non-responders. They might need to take a lot more to get any effects, in which case they start to develop gut issues, in which case I'd say don't don't supplement with it. Uh, what happens when you go off? Well, when you go off, you might lose the extra pound or two of, of water that 
creatine helps you know maintaining your muscles. And you might lose a little bit of what's called ATP. That's the energy that creatine uh, produces more of in the body. So you might lose a, a tiny bit of strength. How does this translate? For the average person, when I, when I control things really well with clients and with myself, creatine would add about five pounds to a lift mm -hmm. for the average man. And maybe a little like less. one more rep. Yeah, like one or two more reps. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like this huge profound effect. But remember, we're talking about supplements. Okay. So in supplement land, that is profound. <laughs> Most yeah. supplements will do zero yeah. when it comes to something like that if you if everything is the same. So, so that's about it. So it's not like you're going to notice this huge crazy effect. What you might notice when you go off, you might notice you're not as strong, maybe a little bit. Maybe you're a little more sore. Um, vegans tend to notice a, a cognitive boost when they're on it. But aside from that, if your digestion's good, everything's good, uh, it's actually a health supplement. So. My, my favorite part about answering this question is uh, it gives us an opportunity to kind of highlight, and we, we've talked a little bit in the past about this, but this just goes to show you how how little of an effect that supplements have. You're t we are talking about the best- The best one. The best supplement on the market. Uh, it's uh, almost certain that what you have is the real deal. Um, but it, that's how minimal of an effect it really has on our overall results. When you think about the big things to focus on and you're taking the best thing out there. The, but I think that's a very common question I'd get with clients is because creatine is touted so much in the fitness space as like the holy grail of supplements for building muscle, people take it and they're like, I don't feel anything, right? Well, I don't notice anything. And it's like, yeah, that, that's how, how insignificant supplements are in the grand scheme of things. And to Sal's point, like the only way, like even I feel it is I have to be, uh, you know, and of course I've, I've controlled so many things, diet and, and training consistently for long periods of time that I can feel a little bit of a difference when I take it. I feel like Justin said, I can get maybe one more rep out or like Sal said, I noticed that my body's holding a little bit more water in my muscles. So I look fuller, which I like. Uh, but it's so minimal. It's and I I can tell because I've been doing this for so long and I've measured it with and without the average person. Real real hard to tell uh, how much of a difference creatine is really making. But it is helping. Yeah, and five grams a day. Just take five mm -hmm. grams a day. That's about right for most people. Mm -hmm. Got you. All right. Does that help you? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right, man. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Boy, I tell you, it's uh, the the. <laughs> how low the standards are in the supplement space. Like, you know, yeah. creatine is the best. Why? It's It does something. It actually does something. Yeah, yeah. everything else does nothing, <laughs> you know, for the most part. And then this yeah. does something and it's measurable. Beta alanine is another supplement they can measure in studies. But unless you're super dialed and you know your body and you take it, you're not going to notice, except for maybe the tingly effect that gives some people in their skin. Well, you said something that I think is so right. important. It's like, him simply changing a program is yeah, he's not going to know what to compare it to. Anyway. That is so significant. And mm -hmm. like the, in the, the grand scheme of things, when it comes to building uh, muscle, getting stronger, losing yeah. body fat, switching to a new program will be more profound than taking an, much more adding a supplement or taking, getting a, a good night's rest mm -hmm. will be more profound is where being hydrated is going to be more profound. I mean, th there's a, yeah. a whole host of things that will be more profound uh, as far as like I feel the difference in my workout than taking that supplement. And and we know that that's the best in the market. But I think a lot of people, especially clients when they first get into the space, are sold on it because everybody pushes creatine because yeah. of the, all the studies. Now, there are there is a small percentage of people that notice a very big effect from creatine, and they tend to be vegans who eat no animal products and low protein. Yeah. And it's because they, they just it's don't get any in their diet. Yeah. And then when they supplement with it, I've had, I, I, I remember I've trained a lot of people. I've only had maybe two clients, I can think of right now, two, and the whole time I've trained people where they took it, and maybe a week later, they're like, oh, my gosh, I can well, really feel this. But everybody else is like, well, I don't know. Yeah, what you're highlighting, though, is the deficiency. right? Correct. There? Because that I mean, that was the experience when you hear me talk on the show when I do when we do commercials for Ned and I talk about that's how I talk about the uh, magnesium, because I was so deficient. It's yep. not that the supplement per se is like, oh, my God, it's the holy grail of getting great sleep. And, but it was for me because I lacked. You were deficient. Yeah, I was deficient. So that's why that matter. And that's a, so that your point about creatine, it's like, totally. yeah, oh, absolutely. If you're deficient, it'll make a huge difference. But most people, nah, they ain't going to feel it. Totally. Look, if you like our show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.
Hey, do you want some meatheads out here talking about fitness and other stuff? Well, we got it for you. Yeah. Meathead time! 